Hey, everybody, welcome to the Gym Masters Show, Entertainment Lifestyle Variety Talk Show Series. How's everybody doing today? It's so good to see all your smiley faces. And thanks for joining us from all around the world. Our show originates from the New York area here in the United States. We go coast to coast here in the States, up to Canada. We've got viewers that watch us in Mexico and South America and Europe, Africa, Asia, Australia, New Zealand. Even Antarctica. We did find somebody in Antarctica, too. Good to have everybody wherever you're watching around the world. We hope you're having a good day. If you're not having a good day, we're going to charge you up because we've got an amazing guest who's joining us. You may remember him from the popular pop duo Yell. Yeah, really popular. We're talking about Daniel James joining us live and direct from England and the UK, of course. And we're really excited to have him here. And let me tell you a bit about his background if you uh, are familiar with him you know who i'm talking about if this is the very first time let me tell you singer actor television presenter as well he competed in a song for europe in 1986 with no easy way to love to represent the united kingdom in the 1986 eurovision song contest he also appeared in the 1987 horror film bloody new year he hosted but first this and was under of course daniel james one half of the pop duo yell he also has appeared in the age uk advise uh, advertisement as well and he recently did a podcast for uh stock aiken waterman's show where he talked about music and being part of yell and so much more in addition to being a great singer and songwriter and so much more he's also an actor yeah he has appeared in uh, some of your favorites eastenders on the bbc absolutely passions on nbc he's also been in several films and so much more and uh you know he's got a great sense of humor we were just making each other laugh just seconds ago before we went live on the air but you remember him of course from the group yell yeah 90s hit maker with paul varney and together you know they penned a lot of great music and uh, were on the charts and then, uh, you know, he took a little bit of a break and we're going to talk about all the cool things that he's been working on and all the cool things. There they are when they were yell, popular group again. And uh, and he is making music again. And really, we're excited about it. This is um, Set Your Spirit Free. He also has Do You Remember? We're going to talk about that in just a second as well, which is another fantastic one. Daniel James, again, he's got a spirit for life. He loves people. He loves what he does. And uh, we're so excited that he's back out making music once again and sharing it. Uh, was away for a little bit and uh, is back in action again. If you remember him from Yell, then uh, I know you're super excited and uh, get on top of a mountain and yell that he's on the show here because we're excited to welcome him. In addition, you know, he's uh, he's talked about life too. He's talked he's been very open, talked about his life as well and the things he celebrates and he's passionate about and it's my pleasure to welcome him again live and direct from uh, beautiful England. And uh, gang, if you would like to comment during the show, feel free to do that. You can absolutely do that during the course of the show because uh, if you would like to comment, we have our lovely chat room. That is when the show's on. We have a uh, chat room where you guys can chat amongst yourselves, say hi to one another. Sometimes, you know, even get a chance to sprinkle a comment or two on the screen. But if you want to comment right now, subscribe to our YouTube channel, which is Gym Masters TV. We welcome you to do that when you subscribe to the YouTube channel then that allows us to know that you're enjoying all the episodes. We've done almost 800 episodes of our series, which is absolutely amazing. And again, um, if you want to talk to each other, feel free to uh, subscribe to the YouTube channel. Don't forget to uh, give us a thumbs up and leave a comment for us on our YouTube channel as well. As I mentioned, coming to us from uh, England is Daniel James. He's got a lot of new cool things to share with us, so we're very excited to have him here. So put your hands together and welcome Daniel James to the Gym Masters Show right now. There he is. Hey, Daniel. Hey, Jim. Welcome. Jim, look. What a welcome. Listen, I need to take you with me. Can I can I hire you as my PR man to take you? That's the best build-up I've had since since my mother gave birth. <laughs> and that was quite a build-up for you and for her. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
that's what my dad said. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say. <laughs> so, but thank you for having me. It's great to ah, be on board. And I, you know, hello to everybody out there. It's great to be part of your show. Thank you. And I love uh, your graphics at the beginning. Is that you sketching at the beginning or is it? Actually, that's a, uh, that's a renowned uh, illustrator who is a friend of mine. And we, when we wanted to, uh, we had an older open and when we wanted to change the open, I reached out to him. I said, you know, I want to do something different. What do you think would be good, popular? What would be, you know, in for now? And he said, let me tell you, retro is really, which is perfect for, <laughs> I was going to say. You're talking to me? He said, talking to me? <laughs> he said, retro is so hot right now with everything. So he said, let me do this. I'll put some ideas together. And, uh, and and that's actually the blending of two things. The the part where he, you know he is uh, doing sort of the sketch and the color of the uh, the animation of the Gym Master Show with the uh, that's actually an I Dream a Genie bottle that smoke comes out of because we have the genie bottle like right there from the TV fantastic. series. And so he, that was one separate entity. And then he wanted to create the logo and illustrate that. So he illustrated the logo and we sort of merged the two things together and then i said i love the logo it's very you know when we were looking at different versions that he put together and he said yeah retro's in so he created that retro design and then but it was stagnant so i said gee i'd love for it to sort of pop out of the screen you know that since this is visual and i come from tv and everything i would really love for it to sort of pop out of the screen and move he said oh well i'm an illustrator but i'm not an animator but my and that daughter cost, you know, that cost you another 50 bucks that would be another 50 bucks yeah that it was not cheap that's for sure and i got the friendly or the uh family and friends discount and it still was up there as we say as we say in england you got mates rates <laughs> mates rates exactly and uh or the bloke bargain <laughs> so uh he was at the time he designed the logo he was um he was working on the cover of Aerosmith's album, uh, wow. like a album that they were doing, a retro mm -hmm. album. And so he said his daughter does animation and she does it for the Tonight Show with uh, Jimmy Fallon on NBC. Let me see if I can get her to animate it. So she then took it as the still and she animated it, brought it to life. And then we put it together from, uh, from there. Yeah. It's really, I mean, what a really classy background. The only thing is slightly, um, you, they've made you look a little bit like George Bush jr. When he was young, so that's a compliment. You know? look what happened to him, you know, he made, it, he made it big. Yeah. So it bodes well, it bodes well, you know, <laughs> nuclear <laughs> <laughs> so you're in england right now what part of england are you in? are you in london i'm in a very old part of england called spitalfields sorry i'll just wipe the lens of the camera i was there. just about to say yeah uh, did you uh, say something yes yeah. it's a very um it's very old i live in a cobbled street and strangely enough in my street i won't tell you the name of it but in my street there was a New York man called Dennis Seavers. And if you Google Dennis Seavers, he has a house and everything in it is as it was in Dickensian times. Wow. And every first Sunday, I think it's every first or second Sunday of every month, people come from all over the world and they stand outside and you look up and it's three stories and you see the windows and you can see like, Victorian characters looking out of the windows. And when you go in, it's all coal and it's all as it was exactly in Dickensian times. Because where I live, it's where Charles Dickens wrote Hard Times, Nicholas Nickleby and all, you know, his books and stuff. So I live in a very historical area. I mean, I don't know what I'm doing here, but, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we were talking about, um, you know, at the time of this airing of the broadcast, uh, a very busy several weeks there in England with the passing of Queen Elizabeth uh, the second, uh, the whole world stopped and you've been there, you know, in the, in the thick of it there in England. What's the mood? What's everything been like there for you guys there? I think whether you're a royalist or not, and I've got some friends who are, um, they're not wildly Republican, but they're, they're not really that mad of the, about the royal family. But even they were shook, I think, because it was a lady that, you know, was an old lady and we've watched her age. 
And um, I don't think you'd have to have the hardest heart in the world not to feel very sad when an old lady passes, but a, and especially an old lady that's that's um, worked so hard and she believed in something very old fashioned, which isn't very common these days, which is duty. She made that vow when she was in her, her early 20s that she would devote her life. And I don't think that kind of emotion is, is very common these days. And I think there were so many amazing documentaries on television. When she died, I, strangely enough, I was at a funeral of a good friend of mine mm. um, when she was dying. And it was near North Holt, which is the airport. It's a very small airport, but it's where the royal family and the politicians fly from. And when we were at the funeral, we could see all these jets flying off up to Balmoral, up to Scotland, to see if they could see the Queen just before she died, because it was the day that she died. And um, I think it just took everybody by shock because she's been with us for so long. Yeah. Um, as I say, love her or hate her, um, you have to respect what she did with her life. And apparently, according to most of the world leaders around the world, whether they be left all right, she was a very wise lady. I mean, you know, if you can imagine, Winston Churchill used to sit across the table with her and discuss what was going on. So if her knowledge and history and wisdom goes all that way back, irrespective of whether you approve of paying for the monarchy or not, that's got to be somebody with a lot of wisdom. And also, imagine having to deal with so many different political leaders, not just in this country, because she met 15 prime ministers. She met every American president but one. Yeah. And also people from around the world of different faiths, different lifestyles, whether they de de democracies or not. Imagine have to having that kind of personality where when they walk in the room, you can handle it, you can handle them, you can make them feel at ease. And even if you don't agree with what they do or how they behave, you have to make that meeting go well and maybe get what you need from that meeting. So that's got to be, you know, she's like the CEO of a company yeah. um, with warmth and charm. Absolutely right. So, uh, yes, we, um, I think as a country, we, we were, I think people went into shock. But then I think we went into like this mass sounds a bit cheesy, really, this mass appreciation and maybe what Americans would say a love fest for the royal family. And, and Charles and William jumped out of cars and did this amazing thing where they shook everyone's hands. It's almost like Diana, rest in peace, um, her legacy is how, and I don't think maybe, maybe many people have thought this, but she was of the people. And if you look at... Um, before she came along, I don't think they jumped out of cars and shook hands and, and wrapped their arms around the people. And, yeah. it, and maybe her legacy isn't just her wonderful children and grandchildren, but the fact that they now feel able and see the wisdom in jumping out the car and embracing and listening to their public. And I think that might be Diana's legacy because when before have we seen that kind of thing happen with Prince Charles or or whatever? So I think it's fabulous. You know, that's what they've done. And I think they've drawn the public in, which means they move forward together. They're always so demure and, and gracious. Do you think behind the scenes they yell? <laughs> hey, listen, behind the scenes, from what I was told, Diana used to do her exercises too. You set my lips on fire. Yeah. You won the key to She used to do exercises to my record. Come That's on. That incredible. Get your leotard on. Get your headband on. Get your leg warmers on. Come on. I mean, what better <laughs> on? You know, I might not have a knighthood, but I've got that. And my mother was invited to Buckingham Buckingham Palace. My mum was in my mum was a wren in World War II. My dad was in the Navy. My mum was a wren, and which is the women's Royal Navy. And because of her war service. Um, she was invited to Buckingham Palace, and I, I was looking after my mum at the time, so I escorted her to Buckingham Palace, and uh, oh my, wow, you know, mm. um, I took some photographs while I was there, and the um, the Wren's uh, Society, they have a magazine, the Wren Organization, and they asked to look at the pictures, and they used a photograph. I wonder if I can get it down. Just stay there. Yeah, Give me two we'll seconds. be here. We'll stay Talk right among here. yourselves. 
Hey, Don't everybody. <laughs> you set, set my lips on fire. He, he's ripping the place apart to find that photo just for yeah, us on the gym master I show. I've had to climb there's a couple of the chair. There's, I there's hope, his, I hope you approve of me. Now, can yeah. you see this? Yes. Wow. Look at that. That's my mother with two of the Queen's guards. I can email you the picture. Um, that's my mum. That, that looks, I mean, see. that your mother looks like the queen. Well, she had beautiful skin just like the queen. That is in the archway where they drive in. And, uh, you know, when you see them drive in and drive out. And I have a funny story about it, actually. I'll put my mum down. All right, mum. I'm talking about you. Um, so <laughs> What's your mom's first name? My mum was Winifred Catherine. Winifred Catherine. Um, she's the Irish side of the family. The Irish her side, parents, yes. The Catherine, okay. definitely. Yeah, well, her mom, her dad was called Monaghan, and he was from County Monaghan. I think, you know, I need to go there. We might even own it, you know? So I mean, you're English-Irish? Yeah, well, my dad's side are part Welsh. My mom's side are Irish. So, you know, just yeah. call me a Celt, you know? We've got the Celtish blood. Exactly. I know how so that is, I'm going to yeah. put my mom down there because she's going to watch over us, okay? She'll watch over us, which is a beautiful thing. Someone to watch over, over me. So anyway, yes. So we get to Bucky. I'll tell you the story. I mean, listen. Yeah. Hey. Pin your logos back. I mean, you thought I was going to talk about the music, you know? No, no, but um, we have a graphic for the story. It's a JMS exclusive. Perfect. Oh, <laughs> oh, oh. I haven't. Right. So the day comes. My mum's in like this Hardy Amos suit. It's beautiful. It's like the kind of beautiful suit the Queen used. Well, you've just seen it. She's got the top half on there and yeah. the hat. Wow. And um, and um, so. We're, I'm driving to the palace. We're, we're calling her sisters on the phone. You know, we're going to the palace, you know, and everyone's, it's fantastic. We get there, there's all the security. And as you see, the gates open and like everybody else, we drove in, we had the passes and stuff. And there's a, there's a square inside, there's a big square and there's all the royal apartments around. And it's where the prime minister goes. You know, when the prime minister, when they become prime minister and they have to go and see the queen and she says, uh, I would like to invite you to, um, to 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 start a parliament, you know. So we're parking there. So I'm in my car with my mum, get mum out of the car, and we go off through the house, through the palace, to the gardens. And they are enormous. There's all these marquees down the side, beautiful food. I mean, I took pictures of, I'm not one of those people that takes pictures and put them on put their dinner on Facebook, but I happened to take a couple of pictures because, <laughs> I mean, you know, I might never go back to the palace again, you know. Beautiful sandwiches cut tiny with the crusts off. So if you've got false teeth, you're never going to struggle, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and beautiful cakes, beautiful cups of tea and coffee. And, of course, I'm northern, you know, with some Irish in me. So I love I love my Yorkshire tea. Keep hoping yes. they're going to send me a box, you know. I was um, going to say that's where the masters hail from, the Yorkshire area. Yeah. You what know. you? Where did you grow up? What part? I grew up in the northeast of England in a town called Hartlepool, and it, uh, also in a town called Sunderland, uh, who are famed for their shipbuilding. My granddad James James Shipley Richardson was a shipwright carpenter, and it went down through the family. So. Anyway, beautiful country up there. Yeah. Rugged. Beautiful. If anybody watches the TV series Vera, maybe it's on PBS, I don't know. They're, they shoot in Northumberland and in um, Teesside and County Durham, all around Hartlepool, Sunderland. And we have the best beaches. Unfortunately, we only get the sun for like an hour a year. So is it cold? Is the water cold? It's, it's what we call over there nippy. Nippy. Yeah. Yeah. A little nippy. Which, you know where that re rate comes from, yeah? So um, <laughs> what, what Madonna's husband called her raspberries. Um, right. <laughs> raspberry ripples, Cockney yeah, Rami slang. Yes. Yeah. Anyway, listen, we're a, long way from the, we're a long way from Buckingham Palace, right? So we're in the, <laughs> we park the car, we go in, we have the most gorgeous afternoon, and I take my mum around the grounds. Boy, massive. You know, there are tennis courts at the bottom of the gardens in Buckingham Palace. Who knew? And they're quite old fashioned tennis courts. So you kind of look at them and you imagine the royals and the guests of the royals from centuries who've, you know, played tennis on those courts. Beautiful little private gardens, secret little places. So we had the most wonderful time. Of course, saw the queen. It was all wonderful. And 
towards the end, people are leaving and mum had to go to the bathroom. So she went to the bathroom and whatever. So by the time we get back to the little square, which is just in there, that's the square, right? We're sitting outside. You go through the arches and my car was parked just around here. So we walk back in and lo and behold, my car is the only car left in the square. And standing around my car are several armed policemen. Now we don't have armed policemen really in the UK, but at Buckingham Palace, you have armed policemen and uh, Marines and soldiers all around my car. And my mother and I look at each other and I kind of gulp, you know, and um, as we get near, my heart's going like this, you know, boom, boom, boom. As we get nearer, um, this very official voice says, excuse me, sir, this is your vehicle. And I said, um, yes. And he said, okay, fine. We were getting rather worried, sir, that um, there may have been something very suspicious going on here. They obviously thought there was a bomb in the car and the car oh. had just been left, you know. Talk about last people at the party to leave, yeah. you know. Yeah. Um, I was that busy stuffing mugs and, you know, souvenirs in my pants. Anyway, <laughs> I wasn't. Don't worry. I haven't. Yeah, um, but anyway, <laughs> so the sense of relief is enormous. And, of course, they see my mother who looks beautiful and serene and lovely with the hat. And so they're suddenly fine. So they take a step back from the car. And I mean, these are big guys. You know, these yeah, are big security guys. They mean business. Machine guns. You know, had I put a foot wrong, I'd be dust. Yes. Anyway, so I... My, get my mother into the car. I get in the car and I'm kind of looking at him thinking, whew, whew, you're not going to believe it. The car doesn't start. Oh. Can, you imagine? Can you imagine the heart, yeah. the ticker, you yeah. know? So yeah. I try it once. Doesn't work. I'm saying, mum, don't worry, mum, it'll be fine. Don't worry. Yeah. Start yeah. twice. Doesn't work. Uh -oh. I start to look around now and the guys are now turning back and coming back towards the car, you know, and I'm going, Please start a third time. Third time. Well, this time I flooded the engine now. Yeah. There's, no, there's, not a, there's, not a, there's not a peep out of the car. My mother's looking at me like I'm the biggest disappointment in the world. You know, <laughs> I've embarrassed her already once. Here we go again, you know. Yeah. She's getting on to the midwife to take me back, you know. She, she wanted to yell. <laughs> Listen, viewers, every time he mentions the name of my band, you can have a drink, okay? That's just to say, chick, chick, right? <laughs> You can have a drink. Cheers, every, everybody. Every time we say that word, we owe him five pounds. <laughs> exactly. Which, unfortunately, is now only worth five dollars. It used to be worth ten. Right. Pound, you know, if you want a holiday, come to England because the pounds were peanuts. The dollar, yeah. you can get loads of pounds, you know. <laughs> I, I years I kept some money, you know, when because I'm all, we used to live in the States. I kept some money, and I look at it now, and I think, I couldn't even get a cab with that now, you know. I couldn't even get a cab with it now, no. So, so anyway, uh, so, you were so just about to get pounded if you didn't start that car. <laughs> anyway, you just drink your tea, Mr. Masters. I'll tell a story. Cheers. You, anyway. have, your, you have your mug? Let's cheer. Cheers. Mr. Daniel James, cheers. Mr. What do you Jim have Masters in there? All the best. What do you have in there? Tea as well? Yorkshire tea. It's the best Yorkshire tea in the tea. world. Mm. Who knew they grew tea in Yorkshire with that climate? I didn't anyway. know that. <laughs> so... He's a storyteller stop. too, which is that hey, great. Listen, that's your, your listeners that's are the on Irish the part of you is the storytelling. I love it. Your listeners are either on the edge of their seat or they slipped into a coma. They're waiting for the answer. Come on, <laughs> let's get the tag out here. So the guys are turning round and they've got the big, you know, they've got the big uniforms on. I mean, these are fearsome guys. They're now walking back to the car. You know, if this was a movie with Steven Spielberg, it'd be going, dum, 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 yeah. dum, dum, yeah. dum. you know, the old tickers going, you know. Third time, it doesn't start. So then I roll the window down and he says, having some trouble there, sir, are we? Mm. And I said, um, yes, I'm, I, uh, 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 you know, it's the car way. won't start. So he says, hmm, well, it looks like we're going to have to try and help you, doesn't it, sir? Mm. So he makes me feel about this big, you know? Yeah. So yeah. suddenly um, there are, he, uh, then he says to me, I, then they all get behind me, right? So there's guys with machine guns. There's big policemen all behind the car. And he says, right, we'll push. When I shout, you start the car. So they're pushing. And my mother says to me, 
what's that banging noise? Because all you can hear is <laughs> what's that banging noise? You can all just hear this banging noise, you know. And and suddenly we realize a little loose. <laughs> no, no. How dare you say that about my mother? No, <laughs> no. <laughs> She's just sitting here now, you know. No, seriously, yeah. it's not that. It's the machine guns. Yeah. As they're pushing, the machine guns are banging against the back of the car. No. Not a very reassuring feeling for me, no. you know. No. Anyway, yeah. so the car still yeah. doesn't start. So now we're going round in a square, in the square <laughs> with the royal apartments up. I happen to look up, and I swear to you. I swear to you, the curtain went back and I'm positive that Queen Elizabeth II was looking down. Yeah. And I said to my mother, yeah. bang goes any knighthood for me, you know? <laughs> anyway, the car's still not starting. Uh, so obviously the, obviously the big guy, you know, the big guy, you know, says, uh, do you think I better get in, sir? So I step out of the car and the big guy gets in. Well, of course, he's got legs this side of Christmas, yeah. you know? They're practically wrapped around the steering wheel. He's got the boots on. He's got the spurs. You know, the <laughs> clanking. I think my mother was happy, but, you know, I wasn't yeah. too happy. <laughs> anyway, so we then, I then stand in the middle of the guys with the machine guns watching the clanking. Because now they're not only clanking against the car, they're bashing against my leg, right? So we're pushing the car round Buckingham Palace. My heart's pounding. We go round three times. Seriously, I was in a band. We sang, let's go round again. I tell you, I was humming it. I was humming it because we went round three times. Eventually, three, third time is a charm. The car started. The guy sat there and he said, the battery is obviously very low, sir. I don't want to take my foot off the pedal. Should I drive you home? Of course, my mother's beaming in the car. She's thinking, great, you know, this handsome man. And she's, she's almost saying, yeah, you get the subway and I'll drive home with him, you know, bless her. Um, but so what we do is we then have to do this little maneuver where he gets out of the car with leaving the foot on the pedal and I've got to slide in and put my foot on the pedal. I mean, seriously, we were nearly engaged, you know. Anyway, we managed to do it. We're back in the car. I roll the window. Well, the window's half down. I roll it down. I turn around and I say, thank you so much for that. And he just looks at me and he says, sir, don't let it happen again. I'd hate for my boys to get angry. So we drive off. And as we drive off, as I say, I peep up at the window and I nudge my mother and I say, look, look. And my mother looks up at the window as well. The queen was watching. Can you imagine? It was probably highly entertaining for her watching this guy. I mean, nobody, apparently, I checked out later on, nobody has ever broken down in that square before. So can you, you imagine? First. You yeah, were the first. I was the first. And, you know, and can you imagine? never driven there again. <laughs> no, well, I think I've got my poster up. Um, a wanted yeah. man, you know. Wanted Seriously, man. we drove out. I went out of there like a rocket. I just, because obviously the battery was flat in the car. So if I took my foot off the pedal, it could have stalled. And my mother, my mother said to me, for goodness sake, don't stall again. My, you know what I mean? She was sorry. She didn't, you know, how many more times don't can you stall again? Me? You know what I mean? <laughs> it sounds like a title of an album. Don't stall again. I told you since you were two years old, stop stalling. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, she did warn me not to stall. You know, she told me what would happen to me. Anyway. Could you imagine if you were, if that car had started when they were behind the car and they were pushing it with the machine guns and the car had started and let out one big backfire? That would have well, been problematic. They would have probably just, they'd have probably just thought my mother had wind. But, you know, that's the problem with the elderly. <laughs> But can you imagine? I mean, nobody, but nobody breaks down. It. But first of all, you not only that, you walk in and you, you know, you're with your mother, you've had a lovely day, you've met the queen, you've done the hello with a little finger, and they, they look at you. I mean, they really seriously thought that you oh, know that this was now. Do yeah, you think it would have been a different turn of events if your mother wasn't with you? I'd have been locked up and I probably would not be doing this interview now. I'd be eating gruel still in the tower. <laughs> and anyway, you formed a new group called hell <laughs> hell yeah exactly what a story huh gee well there you go if your listeners are still awake and they, they are there asleep, they are <laughs> they've probably grown beards and that's just the lady right. you know they're probably that bold with it you know anyway so... <laughs> ask me about my music change the subject quickly i, I was gonna say yeah have some more tea uh that's a fantastic Jeez, story i don't think anybody was gonna hear a story like that that's fantastic and it's it's 
it's serious, but it's hilarious at the same time. So I absolutely loved it. Um, Only I could embarrass my mother in that way. You know? <laughs> so you, was there music in the house growing up? How did you get no. into music? Well, no. How did you get exposed to music? This, this is the really strangest thing. My mother had a beautiful voice, but my dad didn't really like music. Well, you know, in like, on Saturday night, we'd have TV shows and we had a woman called Scylla Black. She had a big number one with anyone who had a heart, you know, huge star in England and, and around the, some of the globe. And um, she had a Saturday night TV show and every American guest that would come in would fly in and they'd sing a duet with Scylla and they'd do a solo number, you know, a little bit like the Andy Williams show or, yeah. show, oh, yeah. you know, Scylla would do sketches and stuff. Well, my dad would never have it on. You know, I would be shouting every Saturday night, can we watch that show? And he'd never have it on. And then on a Thursday night, we had a huge TV series called Top of the Pops. Oh, yes. Think yeah. about America. It's like kind of like American yeah. Bandstand. And like it was legendary. It started yeah. in 1960 and it got huge ratings every Thursday night. Everybody sat down to watch that. You went into school the next day going, did you see Top of the Pops? You know, it was, right. it was huge. Well, I want, you know, on a Thursday night, he wouldn't let me watch it. So I, although my mum sung, I never grew up with music. I I used to, um, where did I, th what it was in my primary school, I got, I got to play Joseph in the nativity. I don't mean in the Technicolor dream code. I, I mean, was just about you know, to say there's in, a little um, bit of a difference. Yeah. Mary You're in the nativity? In the stable, you know, and I don't know. I remember when I was five. The first week at school, I ended up singing a song called Little Bird. Little bird, I have heard what a lovely song you sing. I was five. Forgive me. Um, <laughs> but, but, you know, I remember singing that. But I never I don't ever remember saying, please, miss, can I sing? So I don't know how I ended up singing. And then about five years later, we were doing the nativity and I played Joseph and I had a solo. And I can remember it very you know cold winter night the north of england you know even the rats had coats on it was that cold you know <laughs> the, the school hall is jam-packed my mother's on the third or fourth row in the middle my brother is a my brother and sister are way older than me my mum and dad i literally was a mistake you know seriously my, my brother and sister are so so older than me they were like in senior school when i was still at home with my mum so or my a brother, delightful surprise no, my you? mother said that was a mistake, and she reaffirmed <laughs> that when I was. She reaffirmed that when I was in the car. Um, but seriously, I was totally unplanned. You can imagine this big lump coming along. So, I'm in there. My brother um, was training to be a teacher, and he he, he taught metal work. Well, he taught art, and he made me a staff, a staff, metal stuff. You know. So I'm standing there. My mum had got me the cloak made. I was dressed as Joseph. And I had this really beautiful, I think I sung something like Oh Holy Night, which has these really high notes. Oh, holy night, the stars are shining. You know, that one, you know? Of I course, won't yeah. You don't want to, you know, if I sing it now, I love six cats at the door howling. Um, oh, they love when the animals come in. If you talk animals and food, they you've got them. Ah, well. So I'll tell you about Sophie in a minute. Who let the cats in, in as opposed to who let the dogs in, who let the cats in. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you about Sophie in a minute because I had a cat who I took on TV when I presented her first this, and she had kittens, and I took the kittens on TV with me. She had Incredible. kittens live on TV? I had kittens live on TV. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so I'm in the school hall. I'm this, you know, high to a kneecap, got the cloak, got the staff, and I had this really beautiful solo song, and I sang it. But you know what? I remember it was just the pianist and me and the whole school hall was just silent. And I just felt it's a strange thing to say, but you feel this strength, I suppose, because they're all listening to you. And I didn't ask for it. I don't know how I got to play the part, but I remember singing the song and a typical of my daddy was always late. The door went just as I was about to start the song and Frank, my dad, walks in the back and stands at the back. You know, my dad would be late, was late to his own funeral nearly, actually. Right. Um, bless him. And um, so he's standing there. I felt better when he came in because I was a bit like, well, my mom's there. I'm glad. Where's my dad? Anyway, so I sing the song. And when I hit the high note, I held it for a couple of extra bars. You know, wow. have you seen my lungs? Yeah, yeah. And um, <laughs> they, they, just, they just gave me this, ah, this big cheer. And I suddenly felt this really great feeling. 
And I knew then that I liked that. And I think that's what stayed with me when I went into senior school. But the worst thing about senior school, talk about the universe, like giving me a kick up the kick in the you know what, because I get to senior school and I'm a big lad. When I was um, when I got to about 12, 11 or 12, I, st I wasn't very tall, believe it or not. I'm over six foot now, but I wasn't very tall. And I, I started to eat and I got wider. So when I was in the senior school, the rugby teacher now in the States, you probably don't know what rugby is. It's kind of like a little bit like American football um, without the helmets. And um, but you play it on very but cold. It's a rough sport. Than, and well That's a rough sport. sport. Yeah. Yeah, it's hard. Tough, like, yeah. I'll tell you a quick story. I remember where I'm in the class and the uh, the rugby teacher comes in. Oh, so the rugby teacher also runs the drama group, right? What an so interesting says, you know, uh, dichotomy. <laughs> well, he says to me, you know, he says, you know, uh, I hear you can sing, I blah, blah, blah. You were Joseph in the blah, blah, blah. Um, <laughs> do you want to be in the drama group? And I said, yeah, cool. I, I, you know, it'd be great. He said, yeah. He said, and he looked me up and down and he said, only if you're in my rugby team. Well, the rugby team, I like football, which is soccer. You know, right, I'm soccer. a big soccer fan. My dad had trials for Sunderland when he went when, before I was even born. My dad played, my brother played for like England team, university teams. So that kind of thing is in our blood. You know, my mum and dad and I, we always watch this, the soccer, the football. So rugby was a no no for me. I wasn't interested, particularly when he insisted I go out for a, a trial with the team and there are stud marks in the icy ground and this guy runs past me and tackles somebody so you grab them by the waist from behind drag them down bare knees you scrape them along this hard icy ridden floor so we get in the showers all the lads are in the showers after the match this match is over and i look down and i said steve look at your arm mm. he had two teeth embedded in his arm, where he grabbed the guy, he'd gone past his mouth, and he pulled the teeth. The teeth were in his arm. So when I saw the teeth in the arm, that's when the penny dropped. That was. I don't think I, don't think I want to do the rugby. So <laughs> I politely said to Mr. Grattan, I didn't want to do the rugby. And he said, he was this big Welsh guy, and he went, boy, you don't want to do the rugby. You don't do the drama. <laughs> By the way, he was – um. Welsh going on Brooklyn, you know? Uh, yeah. <laughs> so I couldn't do any drama. So I get one song in the infant school. I get one song in the junior school. And the whole of my senior school, I get no performing arts at all. Oh, wow. So wow. where on earth I, you know, where on earth? But I did get into the National Youth Theatre, but my dad wouldn't let me go. So that was another thing. So I think I'm basically here. You know, you know Phil Collins had a song called Against All Odds. I think my gravestone would probably have against all odds against all odds right huh yeah so anyway that's a little potted history um which you know you didn't really want to know no that's fantastic i mean yeah absolutely so you said to me how did i get into singing and i genuinely don't know i did have a band at school very briefly uh, i want you to try and guess the name of the band you know when you're a kid at school you, yeah you're looking at me thinking what well, could i guess you know no, you know when you're a kid at school and you think you're really cool and you come up with a name? Listen, yeah. we had a band and we were called <laughs> – sorry, I'm embarrassed. <laughs> the band were called Hot Ice. Hot Ice. Hot Ice. Hot Ice. I mean, give us a break, you know, kids. You know, hot we thought we Ice, were too, hot with ice. the British accent. Hello there, of, sir. How are you doing with your Hot Ice? Would you like a little bit of Hot Ice with your drink there, sir? <laughs> Yeah, hot ice. Can you imagine? I mean, that was that because vanilla was already taken. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, come on, you know. And also, it was cold up there, you know. Yeah. You know, you you put your shorts on for school, and all your hand was hot ice. <laughs> it couldn't be vanilla ice that was already taken. <laughs> Ooh, yeah. So basically, I don't know how I got into it, but I think that key moment for me, and also, you know, what I think there is, I think there's a bit of a stubborn streak in me, because I think when he stopped me doing it yeah I think it was this little rap my mum's always had this ramrod of steel up her back you know because she had a tough upbringing and and I think that I think I've inherited it and I think there's a little part of me was like really you know I'll do it but I'll do it without you you know yeah. and I think that's what came plus I had it I had another teacher in school um 
who was asking, he was going around the room and asking people what they wanted to do. I came from a really working class background in the northeast of England. You know, there wasn't any, um, you know, when I grew up, there wasn't the X factor. There wasn't, you know, America's Got Talent. You know, there was probably one talent show, but there was nothing like that. We didn't have like Glee. You know, we didn't have proms, you know, or anything like that. So he goes around the class and um, he asked me what I wanted to be. And I said, a singer and an actor. And he said, just come, come to my desk, boy. Come, to, you know, like Charles Dickens, you know. Yes. Come, come to my desk, boy. You can see what kind of school I went to, can't you? Yeah. Anyway, he said, to me, he said to me, um, yeah, he said to me, tell me again what it is you want to be, boy. So by then, you know, I had a choice. Either my bottom lip quivers or my foot taps, or I just stand there and tell him, you know. So I just said, I want to be a singer and an actor. And he said, what? And I said, sir. And he whacked me right across the ear. I think I'm still a bit deaf in one of my ears, pardon. Um, <laughs> he whacked me really hard across the ear. And he looked at me and he went, you can't possibly go on the stage, young boy. You weren't born in a trunk. Mm. And I said, wow. Right. And he said, do you understand what I mean? And he said, if you want to be on the stage, you've got to be born in a trunk. So obviously, apparently, you've got to be born in a trunk. So yeah, that was right. it. You know, I from that moment, he just totally sent me out of the room. So that was my that was my career's advice at school. So as you can see, I think looking back, this is a bit like my therapy. I've now realized I'm only here to annoy my teachers. <laughs> and there's probably a real career I should be doing. Probably if they'd said to me, of course, Daniel. Yeah, you can be a singer. You can be an actor. I'd have had nothing to rebel against. I'd probably be an accountant. I'd probably have more money if I was an accountant. <laughs> but you definitely, you know, you took the bull by the horn and said, hey, this is what I want to do. What was like one of the first opportunities for you that was a pivotal well, moment in your career where you started to get some notoriety? Well, I had notoriety anyway. It's cool after that. Yeah. But seriously. Seriously, there was nothing where I lived. When, when I was young, you had to leave the small town and you all had to go to London. So I moved to London and um, the first job, I, well, two things, came, two things came at the same time. I played Bassanio in The Merchant of Venice at the Young Vic for the Young Vic Youth Theatre when I was, I think, 17. Can you imagine Sir Laurence Olivier? They'd all been on that stage. That's right. And I'm on the stage at the old Vic, Richard Burton, you know, Ralph Richardson, you know. I, I mean, come on. So that playing Bassanio, I mean, my mum and dad came, the family came. It was amazing. And full costume, everything. That kind of gave me the belief that, that it was possible. But a very, a very nice thing happened. I got a small part. Um, when I was 17, in a movie called Ragtime. Mm. James Cagney. Yeah. Um, Norman Mailer. James Cagney's best friend was in it, um, whose name infuriatingly has slipped my mind. Very famous actor. Um, and it was shooting in Shepperton Studios. Big studios, southwest of London. The snow was about eight inches. I mean, it was really big on the floor. I had to get up at four in the morning, walk. I lived in Chiswick in West London by the Thames then, really pretty. But you couldn't see the pretty. It was like snow, you know, it was old, oldie. I walked to the station at four in the morning, waited for the first train, got the train to Shepparton Studios. They picked me up, took me there, dressed me, and I walked on set. Now, believe, bear in mind, my parents grew up when they were watching the TV and the movies. Jimmy Cadney was an idol. Yankee Doodle Dandy, oh, Angels yeah. with Dirty Faces. I mean, you know, wow. I'm standing on a set. I've got a small scene with, oh, I wish I could think of his name. It wasn't Donald O'Connor. I'm kicking myself. But the man's wife, this was one of James Cackney's best friends who was also an actor. Um, anyway, to cut a long story short, I'm standing on a set that looks like a New York, old New York street, you know? old New York sidewalk, everything. Yeah. And there's a ship, there's a whole ship being built in the studio. It, and I have to escort this lady down. And we have a conversation. I go up the gangplank. 
we have a conversation and then we talk as we're coming down and I bring her down the gangplank. And then I stand on the set, Norman Mailer, the famous writers there, James Cagney. I mean, I'm standing two feet away from an icon of the industry. You know, it was the last film role that man ever played. And I think he only did it as a favor, you know, incredible, incredible icon and little old me was in there. So I knew from that moment, I just knew that it was meant for me to be in the business because those kind of opportunities don't come along if it's not meant to be. And so if you what, just, was there an audition or something? How did you yes, hear about yes. this part? Well, yes. Um, well, what I'd done is when I first moved to London, I knew nobody. I used to cycle around London. I still cycle London now, not because I'm a climate change green activist, just because when you first move to London and you have no money, you can't mm. afford the subway. You can't afford yeah. the bus. You either yeah. walk or you bike. I got myself a secondhand bike. And what I did was I followed all the cabbies because cabbies, taxi drivers, they know all the back routes. They know all the side roads. They know all the quick stuff. And I lived all the way over in West London. And it was like an hour to cycle into Leicester Square, Piccadilly, Shaftesbury Avenue, you know, where all the auditions would take place. So I basically learned, I mean, I didn't know London from the back, you know, I did some magazine work to get some money before I moved to London. Um, in England, uh, in the UK, there were some magazines uh, and I was on the cover of some magazines like My Guy, Oh Boy, Jackie. And they were magazines for like young girls, you know, from say, seven to 15 16 you know yeah, maybe yeah. 12 to 15 and they'd have a pop star on the cover or yeah, a guy on like the cover. 16 or tiger beat here yeah. yeah well i did all i did all those magazines and also they'd have photo stories inside and so um you know they'd have little bubbles they'd take pictures of you with a girl and you'd be having a love story or an argument and it would be like a four-page story right and they'd have bubbles coming out and i you know i earned my i earned money to start my career you know by doing that and that kind of kept me going. And then I got an agent in Tin Pan Alley, which was Denmark Street, for Denmark Street. Believe it or not, I later discovered, because I do this radio show called Bangers and Chat, and it goes out, it's syndicated all over the place. In fact, some New York stations, some American stations need to take it. It's a two-hour show. I play 70s, 80s, and 90s, and a few 2000s. But what I do is I research the backstory of the song. Who wrote it? Who remixed it? How many times it was released? Some fascinating stories. The story of Harry Nielsen would mm. make your hair curl. If you don't know the story of Harry Nielsen, listen to my show. I told the story. People were messaging me crying when they heard the story. Brooklyn from rags to riches and rags again. Yes. An amazing story. You know, there are so many stories about people in the industry and how they got into the business, how they wrote the song. And also sometimes a record is released four, five, six times before it becomes a hit, you know? Yeah. So anybody go online, look for bangers and chat, Daniel James. And um, I tell the story behind the hits. And um, in one of the stories, um, God, I've, I've, I've lost my thread now. It was about one of the people that we were talking about. Um, you were talking about how you you were auditioning. How'd you find Tin out Pan about Alley. the movie? Yeah. And right, yeah. So I'm auditioning in Tin Pan Alley for this agent, and uh, you know it was scary. You know, this, I'm a young kid in an agent's office. You know, don't know anybody. I just, but you know what? You know what? With youth, I think it's a word my mum used to use. It's an old fashioned word, chutzpah. Oh yeah, sure. I, think I had chutzpah. You know, my friend Doreen in Queens will be going, no, chutzpah, Daniel, chutzpah. Yeah, you know? is that um, a Jewish word or a German yeah, word? Or, yeah, well, yeah. My, my friend Doreen, she goes to the synagogue, yeah. you know, she's Jewish. Um, yeah, but we say chutzpah, yeah. Yeah, chutzpah. So I think I kind of had a mixture of that and probably youthful ignorance because nothing scares you when you're young. Right. You know, when you've had the teachers at school I had, what, who, what was going to scare me next? So I went, I knocked, I used to turn up and just knock on the door and say, uh, I'm an actor, I'm looking for an agent. You know, I could have been kidnapped, gagged, tied up and robbed. You know, <laughs> instead I got myself an agent. There's been a story. So I went upstairs. I said, oh, it's hilarious. I went in there and it was really, you know, you see Joey in Friends. Well, yeah. it wasn't a woman, it was a guy. He's just recently passed away called Barry Stacy, And he's sitting there very old fashioned with a cigarette holder, with the cigarette on, with the ash. And uh, it was like something out of an old, um, old British movie. You know, he said, um, name 
you know, it's like really old fashioned. Anyway, basically, I had to sing a song for him, read some scenes, and I got an agent. So a week later, I didn't have a phone. There was a call box at the end of my street on a little park. And I can remember, this is how significant it is. I can re remember the number now, 0181-994-7070. And I gave that number to my agent. And I go to the phone at the end of every day at like five to six. And he'd tell me if there were any auditions for the next day. That's, you know, before answer. I didn't have a phone. I couldn't afford it. So there's me cycling around London, knocking on doors, taking auditions. So I get the audition for Ragtime. And it's an Oscar winning movie director. You know, so that was my first. Later on, I get in some plays. I get my union card. I start working on Top of the Pops as a cheerleader. So I start working on Top of the Pops. This is before I'm a pop star. Um, basically, the, the TV series was huge. But the audiences were kind of just. Yeah. yeah? Impress me. Yeah. Right. Impress yeah. me. So they hired a bunch of us to get among the crowd and get them going. And I then got asked to present the warm up. And basically, before the show started, I did the warm up and got the show started. And that's how I got my first record deal, because a guy came up to me and he said, do you do anything else? And I said, well, I, I write songs and I act. And he said, come and see me at my studio. He said, we've just made a shed load of money on a record and we've got money to spend. And I went to see this guy called Ray, and they ended up recording a version of Bobby Darren's hit, Dream Lover. Dream Lover, where are you? Remember that? Of course you do. Everybody knows that record. So I did a version of that, and I went away up to Scotland to be in a, in a show. And I was in a theatre show in Scotland for two months. And they called me while I was up there, and I, f I flew down to London because I was rehearsing on the Saturday, had to be back on the Sunday, flew down to London, recorded during the night, flew back, carried on with the show. And I'm doing the show and it comes to January and they, they phone me up and tell me they're going to release the record for Valentine's Day. And it's going to be a white heart shaped record. Can you imagine? Mm. First record out, white heart shaped record, Dream Lover. I'm in a record store two weeks before my record comes out. Now, when you mentioned the Eurovision Song Contest in my introduction, there was a lady that won the Eurovision, she, Eurovision Contest called Dana for Ireland. She was only 13 or something, 14, a wee girl, and she sang a song called All Kinds of Everything. Well, that launched her career. Like ABBA, she went on to have a big career. So I'm doing the theatre show. I've recorded Dream Lover. I'm in a record store. And of course, I love record stores. You know, you thumb them, you look at the label. Oh, you yeah. You the, the rider. You know, I feel sorry for kids these days. You know, you download. Yeah. It's a thrill in a download. You spend hours in Tower Records. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, I miss those days. So Makes I'm sense. in the record store. I'm thumbing it. I'm in their ages. The guy's looking at me, you know, I'm taking root. And the he's got the radio one in the background. So I'm listening, and the DJ says, hey, this is the new single from, da from uh, Dana, Dream Lover. Dana brought a version of the record I was releasing. She brought that out. Well, that was my record sunk. Didn't matter if it was a heart shape that set on fire, that spun round. It wasn't going to get anywhere. So that was my first single, Down the Pan, because a famous person brought a version out two weeks before mine two came out. Two weeks before. Isn't that amazing? So I skulked back to London, and then I was in a play called uh, Streetwise, playing this really hard thug, this garage mechanic, you know, real tough guy. And I had a song called Purrs Like a Rolls, as in like a Rolls Royce. And I got a call from my agent to go and audition for a movie called Yentl. Robert Streisand. Can you hear me? Can you see? Yeah. So Lee International Studios in Wembley. Funny enough, later on, we ended up, when I was in Yale, we recorded a Japanese TV show there. But Lee International Studios, Wembley, they were using that as one of the studios. I turn up and um, I was dressed as kind of like a Jewish student. Little glasses, you know, I mean, it's not too much of a stretch for me. And um, I mean, I can read. 
unjust. Um, and I have a papa. Um, well, I did then. Anyway, so I turned up at the studios. Where's your yarmulke? And, um, and, uh, well, no, not quite. Um, but anyway, <laughs> I do the gags. Anyway, <laughs> actually, right. I, actually, I don't. You do quite a few. Yes. You made a good, a good team. We should do a double act. Anyway. Uh, that English-Irish thing, I tell you. Quick, quick, quick. Yeah. Um, so I'm standing there, and they, they, they're they called flats. They're behind the set. Yeah. And it's what, you know, you've got the set. Yeah. And, and then you've got the walls of the flats. Yeah. 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 And it's all bits of wood and stuff. And this lady comes through a door built into the scenery and it's Barbara Streisand, the wonderful Barbara Streisand. But again, I've told my friends in America this, you know, and they're like, oh, you know, because some people like go a little bit crazy, oh, you know? Sure. Yeah. But genuinely, and this isn't arrogance. It was just another job for me, just another audition. I mean, of course, I knew who Barbara Streisand was. I'd listened to the Superman uh, album. I had a, a radio show on hospital radio when I was about 14, and I used to play the, the track Superman from the Superman album, you know? So I knew she was she's standing there in those yeah. shorts on the album cover, blue cover. You know, yeah. the fans will know. Anyway, Would your reaction have been different if Shirley Bassey walked through that door? No. No, I, I, I genuinely think when you're young, I've never been one of those people that go, the only person I've ever been a bit of a fan of, and this may really surprise you, is Linda Gray from Dallas. <laughs> I had a bit of a crush on Linda Gray from Dallas. Yeah. Um, and I went to see her. She was, in, she was in the West End. She played the graduate in the West End. She took over from Kathleen Turner. And I went backstage to see her. Yeah, that was the only person I had a bit of a crush on. I've never been one of those people that's been a fan of yeah. I just appreciate what they do. Appreciate the you know? work, right? Yeah, you know, because it's like you can see how hard they work, you know, because yeah. there's a lot of graft goes in. You know, it looks <laughs> serene on the surface, but they're doing this behind the scenes, right. you know, under the water. <laughs> anyway, so Miss Streisand comes out and um, she's dressed. Obviously, she's just shot a scene. So she's in the full outfit with the, she dressed as a boy, you know, great movie. Anyway, and she's directing the movie as well. I mean, the woman's just like, how talented. So she comes out, auditions me. Oh, hey, you know, and I, but I'm not, I know it sounds really strange. It's an, it's a, it's an audition. You know, I'm at an audition. And I think it's that thing again of I'm in a play. My mind's on the play. Um, it's an audition. I've got to get back because we've got a, we've got a show. I've got to get back because we've got a show. So I do the lines. I do the dialogue. She's very nice. She reads in with me. She chats to me. She's lovely. Very, very professional. She says, nice to meet you. She goes off. I don't even walk around. Do you know, I'm kicking myself today because I didn't even go like and have a little look around the set. You know, have a see how see, watch them shoot a scene, which I could have done. I just got out of there, got on my back. Oh, it was a blooming, I nearly swore then. I nearly said the B word. It was a blooming long cycle, cycle ride back because Wembley's like a bit on a hill where the stadium yeah. is. Yeah. So I knew I had this really schleppy ride back in the in the and i was wearing this really itchy suit and it was like oh, you know like these student trousers and stuff i couldn't wait to get that off and cycle back so i did the audition met the wonderful lady and then two days later i got a call from my agent to say i'd book the job and i had the part i had a part in yentl only a small part but i had lines and lo and behold i was doing this play called streetwise and they wouldn't let me off to do it to do it <sighs> Because there were some night shoots and we, we would clash. Can you imagine? I mean, now I am absolutely the exact opposite as I was then. I was cool and laid back. And oh, well, never mind. Now I'm like, that movie is a movie that's shown all the time. You know, it's a piece of history. You know, she got a, she got a, um, not a Grammy. What, what was the, uh, she didn't get an Oscar, but what's the other one? Golden Globe. She got a Globe. Yeah. You know, for best director, I think. Um, that would have been amazing to be in the, and also the experience oh, being on sure. set with, with her and the guy that played the boyfriend in it and the beautiful Stephen, you know, the lady that was Steven Spielberg's first wife with the red curls. Yeah. To work with those people, can you imagine? Incredible. You know? So Incredible. now in retrospect, I'm like, Papa, you should have heard me, you know? <laughs> Never mind. So basically, that was my life as a job in actor. And I would jump from job to job. And I had, then the Song for Europe track came along and I did that. And then, uh, oh, I had, a, I had a single out with Stock and Aiken. Before they met Pete Waterman, 
I worked with Mike Stock and Matt Aiken on a track called Safety in Numbers. And at the same time I was doing that, I mean, basically, I just used to cycle around and see if people were looking for someone. You know, I, 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 I wasn't, um, I genuinely, I just thought it was a job. I was in London for a reason. My home was 300 miles away. I missed my family so much because we were so close. So if I was going to be so far away from home, I had a purpose. I wasn't going to sit around. My purpose was to get work and become yeah. a success. You right. know, achieve something. So for me, I didn't get up in the morning and switch the TV on and think, let's just, you know, hang around. I was up, I was out on the bike looking for work. It just yeah. was something in me, you know? Yeah. And so I would be going from job to job. And, you know, I would, some weeks I'd shoot three commercials and do a couple of magazine covers. And, but it would, they were just jobs for me, you know? And I was building up and getting more and more work. And I was doing the warm ups for a show called Cracker Jack, which was a legendary, another legendary British BBC TV series called Cracker Jack. And I did the warm up for that. And that's how I met um, the producer, Paul Ciani. So I had this record out that I'd recorded, had this record that I'd recorded with Mike Stock and Matt Aiken. And it was called Safety and Numbers. Well, the B-side was called When Love Slipped Through My Finger. So I took Thursday, we, we, did, we recorded Cracker Jack. So I went in the office, I said, got a single coming out do you want to hear it gave it to paul he said i'll listen to it i'll tell you what i think next week a week goes by and i walk in the office and he said do you want the good news or the bad news so i said give me the bad news first and he said i hate the single mm. he said i said all right what's the good news and he said i love the b-side he said if you can turn that record record over over yeah said, you can have a slot on the show never mind yeah. the warm -up. You yeah. can be a guest singing live on the show. So, of course, the next day I get up, I race to the phone box on the corner, 9947070. I dial a record company. <laughs> still can't afford a phone. I dial a record company and I tell them, and they say, we've pressed thousands. We can't turn it over. So the record came out, and that was my third turkey. I've got more. I've got so many turkeys. People come to me for Thanksgiving, I you know? <laughs> You know, I'm the stuffing. <laughs> so I'm just waiting for the cranberry sauce now. So basically, <laughs> um, three records out. And then finally, I mean, talk about doing your apprenticeship, you know. Finally, I'm presenting a TV series called uh, But First This. Every morning on the BBC live, nine o'clock till 11 o'clock, two hours. It's got, it's got uh, music. It's got uh, animals. It's got um it's got everything in it. it's like a big magazine show two hours live five mornings a week and there's a guy comes to the show called jeff chegwin he's got it he had a famous brother and sister in the country they were djs jeff was a record plugger and they go around to re go around to tv shows and radio try and get records played and i chatted to him a few weeks and you know everybody comes in you say hi what record have you got thought nothing of it so i'm coming to the end of the contract to do the tv series in and um one week i'm sitting there as a matter of interest it's live i've got an earpiece in and i the um the editor comes on the floor and he says got a bit of a tricky one this morning he said there's a summit in moscow reagan and gorbachev he said the continuity man hasn't turned up you're gonna have to go live from your link to Reagan and Gorbachev. Now, bear in mind, I'm a kid on the BBC, and I know that there's a monitor in every office in the BBC. This is the BBC, yeah. you know? Anyway, I think they threw it at me as a bit of a challenge to see if I'd cope, you know? Yeah. And um, I did it. I, you know, there's a timing in your ear, 10, 30, whatever. Yes, in the and IFB, the, yeah. Yep. Yeah, so I did the link, and it all went well. They came on the floor and said, well done, you passed the test. That's how I got the job originally. Um, I'd had a week's trial and then they gave me that in the week's trial as a test. Can you imagine if I'd blown it? I mean, so are you semi remotely responsible because of that involvement with Gorbachev and president yeah. Ronald Reagan yeah. for the end of the cold war and the coming down of the Berlin wall? Yeah. Holy it was cow. You. It and was I go, un I go unrecognized even to this day. I mean, it's shocking, isn't it? That's a you know? reason for anybody to yell. <laughs> <laughs> you set my lips on fire. Every time you say yell, I'm going to sing, you set my lips on fire. Anyway, so 
the show's over, end of the series, end of the season. I'm on an elevator in Shepherd's Bush uh, subway station. And it's really long. It's like something from World War II. We have very, as your tourists will know, some of our stations are still really old. You know, they used to use them as air raid shelters in the war. Yeah. So I'm going, I think I'm going up and Jeff Chegwin's coming down. And he says, hey, how are you? He's from Liverpool. Hey, how are you, mate? And um, no, he's not Welsh. And um, <laughs> I see, he said, what are you doing? He said, I said, oh, the show's finished. It's the last one today. And he says, what are you going to do next? I said, well, I'm going to write some more songs. He says, come in and see me. And he had an office called In No Miss in, uh, between Shepherd's Bush and, uh, and um, Olympia, where the big exhibition center is. And it was a rehearsal studio and it was offices. And every band that had ever been anything in the country, The Who, Spandau Ballet, I mean, all the big bands rehearsed in there for their tours. It was like walking into a who's who, literally, mm. no pun intended, you know. <laughs> and um, so I went, had the meeting with him, and he, I played him So He says, I want to introduce you to another guy. Introduce me to the other guy. And then, to cut a long story short, we then spent about two years writing songs. I would turn up at Paul's house. I, I love the melodies. I, I'm on the treadmill, and I'm thinking of a song, you know. I'm, I'm, like, walking down the street. The thing about thinking of a song is you've got to get it down straight away. You know, so I would put songs down, turn up a pause with the lyrics and the song. Paul was a great keyboard player and engineer. We get the songs done. We got an album's worth of material. And what happened was Jeff Chegwin got us um, a gig with something called the Lunch Club. And this lady ran this thing in schools. And every lunchtime, we toured schools across the country. And every lunchtime, kids would have their lunch and then the curtains would go back in in the hall and we'd be standing there and we'd give them a gig. They didn't pelt us with stuff. It was great. And the good thing about that was because we were touring around the country, we were really thin and all the lunch ladies, the dinner ladies that worked in the schools would feel sorry for us. And like they'd have these big lunches ready for us after we played the gigs. So we loved those, those gigs. So by day we played schools and we built up a fan base and we learned, you know, you learn your, you learn the skills of being a performer. By night, we played clubs and bars all over the country, driving all over the place. So after two years, Jeff said, you need to do a showcase at No Miss with the big boys. So who turns up to the showcase? Simon Cowell. Of course, you all know Simon Cowell. CBS Records, loads of record companies. So we get whittled down. And in the end, two companies are interested in us. CBS, which then became Sony, and Simon Cowell. Believe it or not, I didn't want to sign with Simon Cowell because I knew at the time Simon was very into to covers. And I, I saw myself as an artist. I wrote songs, you know, so I wanted to sign with Sony. George Michael was with Sony, you know, Barbara Streisand, you know, they were big, big record label. Anyway, my arm was twisted. They all voted. And in the end, we signed with Simon. But from the minute we signed with Simon Cowell, our worlds changed because he had money. So we suddenly we go from, you know, the small gigs to big gigs. We have photo sessions. There's clothes. You know, there's everything. You know, we're in a big studio. We're recording the album. And of course, Simon and I, we got on really well. But Simon's very stubborn. And as you've noticed, I'm a little bit stubborn. And I didn't want to do a cover version. You know, um, we, 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 we butted heads several times and he always listened but of course, it's his money. It's his record company. We've signed to the company. There's, you know, I can't exactly go on strike. So we're doing the gigs. We're doing the photo sessions and we're recording songs. And I used to say, you know, Sam, we've written this new song. Do you want to hear it? And he's, you know, he was, he wasn't, he wasn't wildly enthusiastic. You know, he was, he was looking for covers and he couldn't find the song. I'd say to him, what about this song? What about that song? Something I'd written. And he said, yeah, it's great. And I kind of got a little bit disheartened. And I, I remember saying to him one day, you know, do you not like the songs? Do you not like the songs? And he said, come here. Went over to his desk and, um, oh, I'm going to have to plug my phone in. I've just noticed that the uh, battery's going down. Is it? That happens to everybody. <laughs> Excuse me for two seconds. Do forgive me. Oh, no, you wouldn't be a guest on the show if your battery didn't conk out. <laughs> yeah. Dear me, I'm so sorry about this. No, that's fine. Um, that's fine. That's all right. So, so Simon and I are kind of budding heads a little bit in a nice way. Um, and um, 
he says come over and listen to this and he played me it was the day when we had answer phones at home you know voicemail yeah it'd be nice if i could get this answering thing, machines it? right exactly yeah and he, ah i've got mm. it in now am i going to balance that on my knee now so basically simon then plays says dial this number so i dial the number and it's his home at that particular time and um sorry i'm just going to get this to rest on something so it doesn't fall over um yeah. so simon plays me it, it's his voicemail and whoop and um <laughs> yeah uh can you see me still we still see you and hear you yeah good good people are probably throwing stones at the telly by now so lo and <laughs> behold um let me just check the batteries charging i don't want you to go off right so lo and behold um, is that a yes? Does right mean yes? <laughs> I like that. Right. <laughs> so he plays me the answer phone. And lo and behold, he has, guess what comes on? I lie awake and hear you call. I know it's you, but I don't pick up the phone. Me singing. He's put the first 16 bars of one of the songs I wrote for the Yell album, Give Me a Little More Time, as his voicemail. And he says to me, I've got all these women that just ring the phone just to hear you singing. So he's, you know, basically he was trying to tell me he did have faith in me, but he just believed that a cover version would get us through the door on TV stations and on radio stations. And, you know, Simon's a very shrewd businessman and I couldn't really argue with that in the end. And he did yeah. promise me that down the line, you know, we'd have the album out and we'd, um, we'd have a single out that I'd written. Well, so Paul and I went even... off form how did you how did yell even form from the beginning how'd you guys even come together well jeff chegwin introduced us both um when i went to nomis to meet him and that's how we formed he said why don't you two go away and see if you get along and write some songs and that's when i would turn up a pause with the ideas and we kind of we gelled straight away we got on we just you know got on as I say, I just loved writing songs. Paul's a great keyboard player and he's a, a good engineer. And so I just turned up and we started writing songs and the rest is history. The story be be behind um, Instant Replay, we were in Ibiza, two o'clock in the morning, Paul and I are in a bar that's a very chill out bar and um, the dance floor's empty. And suddenly the Dan Hartman version of Instant Replay comes on. I mean, it's fantastic. I so wish that I had worked with Dan Hartman. What a talent, you know. Um, I was doing a sh doing something recently, and he he collaborated with somebody on a, on a hit, Holly Johnson. He collaborated on a track called Americanos. Holly Johnson from Frankie Goes to Hollywood, a big '80s band. Yeah. So I'm doing the history of Holly Johnson, and I suddenly find out that that Dan Hartman collaborated on that album and on that single. And it's like, wow, if only I could have worked with Dan Hartman. Anyway, so we're in Ibiza and suddenly this track comes on. Ten, nine, the floor fills. And I said to Paul, you know what? Simon wants a cover. This is the cover. We got back to Simon's office. Now, bear in mind, we were two young guys. We thought we were cool as cucumbers. I'm just trying to get this. This extension lead to this is the glamour of show business, folks. Like I said, <laughs> behind the scenes, there you go. It's a balancing act. So we go in the office. Simon's in his desk in the big leather chair. Feed up on the feed up on the table. I'm trying to tell a story here, and everything's <laughs> everything's falling apart. I'll have to write a song called "Falling Apart at the Seams." Falling scenes. apart. Yeah. Right. Let me just try and get this to balance because there is a story here. Yeah, so, absolutely. We walk in the office. We've got suntans. We're young guys. We've got the espadrilles, the chinos, the T-shirts. We think we're cool as cucumbers. Of course, Simon's sitting at the desk. He's even browner than we are. Of course, Mr. Perennial Suntan, Simon Cowell, sitting yeah. there with his feet up on the desk. He's, Hello, darlings. How are you? And we walk in. We sit down. And he's got something called the Guinness Book of Hit Singles in his hand. Right? Yeah. That's... It's full of cover versions. It's yeah. every song that's ever happened that's ever been a hit. And he said, I said, Simon, before you say anything, I've got some good news. I said, you know, you've been going on about a cover and I've been, I didn't want to do a cover. We found the cover. And he said, really? What is it? And I said, instant replay, Dan Hartman. Well, his feet swivel off the desk and they hit the floor with his stacked heels. <laughs> and he sits bolt upright with the high-waisted trousers. And the book 
the Guinness Book of Its Singles falls on the floor. I pick the book up and he says, open the book. I opened it. I flipped the pages without a word of a lie. He's folded the page over. And guess where the fold is? Instant replay. Down wow. Down. Now, come on. Yeah. It was meant to be. So yes. I, came, I suggested Nigel Wright to produce it. Nigel Wright's a big producer in the 70s for Shack Attack. Haven't done much lately. We got Nigel to come in and produce it. Once we'd record, do you know what's a funny story is? Simon wanted us to record it in falsetto. I think he was a fan of the Bee Gees. Yeah. Yeah. So we're in the studio. Now, I don't sing for, I mean, I can sing falsetto, but I don't want to sing falsetto. So Simon gets a Saturday. Simon, we're in the studio from 10 o'clock. The backing track's laid down. We've done a guy vocal. Simon arrives, of course, you know, lunchtime, walks in like James Bond, sports car. You know, he's got the Porsche, suntan. It's all there. And he says, hello, boys. What have you got to play me? We play in the song and he looks a bit disappointed. So we look at each other and we think, we've blown it. What's the matter? Because it sounds great. And then he says, I want you to sing it in falsetto. Well, if you'd seen my face, it didn't just drop. It rolled around the garden. It, I had to go and collect it. I, don't <laughs> want to see, I, didn't, I, didn't see my, I didn't see my career doing a falsetto. And I didn't see my career singing falsetto. I mean, occasionally, but not my career, not my first single. Anyway, who am I to argue with the mighty cowl? We go into the... <laughs> Simon we go says. Into, we, we go into the vocal booth and I look at Paul. And we, we, we don't put the cans on. And I take him to the corner and I say, do you want to do this in falsetto? And he shakes his head. So I said, the only way we're going to get around this is if we do the worst job ever. Mm. And I really mean, I said, we've really got to look like we mean it and we're passionate, but we've got to sound like two alley cats mating, right? <laughs> two foxes in love. You know, yeah. if you've heard foxes in love, you'll know what I mean. Yeah. So the track comes on. Simon's sitting there, he's beaming, and suddenly it comes to the queue, and I go, now pin your logos back, because this is not going to be very nice. You set my lips on fire, you want the key to my heart. Seriously. And then Paul comes in with his line, you got a better way to you me, don't stop now. You know, I mean, we kept a straight face, we did the worst falsetto ever and we keep on singing and he carries on and carrying on we do the chorus and suddenly the track stops and we hear this really not really banging noise and simon's banging on the desk and suddenly we see this mm -hmm. and like a really scornful Let's look come here. So yeah. we look at each other and we walk out and he's just staring at us and we completely think we've blown it. Now, bear in mind, this is going to be the first single. We've got the clothes. We've got the photo sessions. We've got everything. And, yes, I didn't want to do a cover version, but I don't want to lose the record deal because, in my mind, the second single, I might write it, you know? Mm -hmm. Anyway, so there's a silence. And as viewers of many television series know, Mr. Cowell can be quite cutting. So we're waiting for the bomb to drop. Again, I'm reminded of my rugby teacher at school, you know, or the one that clipped me yes, around here. Yes, who said, it's, yeah. It's coming. It's like, here we go. Let's go round again. Right. right. Anyway, so like 10 seconds go by, and it feels like an eternity. <laughs> you know what? He breaks into a smile, and he says, boys, you were right. Let's sing it in your normal voices. Hip, hip, array. We go back in. We knock it out the park. You're playing the video now. And it was a great version, even though I say it myself. I love the Dan Hartman version still, but we just brought it up to date. You know, when you do a cover version, you have to give it respect. You either make it totally different or you kind of give it an updated version. And I think that's what we did. We played How'd you guys learn to dance, too? I mean, your dance moves are pretty good here, huh? Learn to dance? What do you mean? It just comes natural. <laughs> Have you not watched Do You Remember Me? Oh, excuse Have you me. Not watched excuse me. Yeah. Let me reword that. It's a, incredible how you guys <laughs> were just born to dance. Because look at these moves. <laughs> viewers at home, this guy, honestly, you said, where did you know? Yeah, seriously, you just do what you have to do. I think we just yeah. enjoy. Can I be honest with you? We just yeah. enjoy. I think you can tell we're enjoying ourselves. Yeah. And we, was this you know, highly was... choreographed, the music video? No. No. Oh, Does it look really? They're just our own moves. The backing dancers 
are choreographed. Yeah. And yeah. the guy the guy on the saxophone is called Venel. Venel worked with Kyle Minogue as yeah. a choreographer and on lots of the dances. And he choreographed those dances and he also played the sax in the video. Um, no, I mean, we're not choreographed. You know, you could say, you set, I think the, the phrase is, you set my hips on fire, <laughs> but not really. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, that was that was our first hit, and we went all over the world. What was we that feeling world. like for you? That oh, had to be incredible, you, huh? You know what? The the biggest thrill for me, well, this one of the biggest thrills was to go back to Top of the Pops, the number one TV show for pop music in the country. This show, you know, you know, uh, in the states, you know, like American Idol. This yeah. show was that big; it was enormous. And yeah. I went back to that show as an artist. I'd been, I'd done the warm up. I'd been a cheerleader dancing around. Can you imagine the thrill for me to walk in as an artist on that show with all the, you know, Sinead O'Connor, they're all on there. Yeah. That to me was the B, as we say in England, that was the bee's knees. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Do you have that saying over there? No, we don't have the bee's knees. No. There you go. So you're learning something every day, the bee's knees. My American friends, I always say things like gobsmacked and I say phrases and they go gobsmacked. Godsmacked. Godsmacked. Yeah. We we sort of overuse the word awesome here a lot. Yes. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> strangely enough, though. Strange enough, even though Fantastic, you overuse, we say a lot. Yeah, but strange enough, you didn't use you didn't use awesome about my dancing, which is strange. I think it's awesome. Well, see, I think it's brilliant. <laughs> That's your word. No, no, no. Super. Super. <laughs> Excuse me, I'm having a slurp. So that's brought you pretty much up to date with Yell. So Yell, we had a great success. Yeah. It was the most amazing time in my life. I would not have missed it for the world. Unfortunately, it ended really badly for me. I woke up one morning. I had fans. I mean, bless my parents. You know, my parents, as I say, working class people from the Northeast, they used to come and visit me and they'd be fans sleeping and going through my bins. My mum yeah. and dad would be fuddled by befuddled. There's another word. My mum yes, and dad would we do smack. use that word here, befuddled. befuddled. Well, my mum and dad were like, you know, because obviously I'm just their son. You know, the last time they saw me at home, they would tell me to make my bed. And right. now I've got people <laughs> sleeping outside my, my place. I've got newspapers going through my dustbins. You know, fame is a crazy, crazy thing. We flew all over the world. We were on 30 magazine covers for the first single. Amazing. But we were together. And after about four or five years, I woke up one morning. And I opened, there were tabloid papers, and I opened them. And it said the band were finished. The wow. band, the rug was pulled from under me. I did not even know. Now, for anybody that's passionate about a job, whether yeah. you're a carpenter, you're a footballer, you're a dentist, if you really like your job, if like me, yeah. you left home at 17, came to the big city on your own and, and grafted. I grafted. It's just in my nature. Yeah. Um, to lose it all over the, overnight. And, you know, I did read they stories. they say about, what happened? Why? No, what? they just they just stopped. They the, just, is they, that the record company or yeah, management? Yeah. Or? No, the record company, it was just kaput. Genuinely. Now, I read stories about artists who, when things happen to them like this, they say, God, I couldn't have got through this without the help of Elton John or whatever. And I'm like, I look back now and I think, I wish I'd known Elton John. You know, because he seems to have helped so many people through the trauma of a career upset, of losing something really badly. I mean, I didn't turn to drugs. I didn't turn to drink. I'm not, I don't have it. I think the only addiction I have is my career, you know. Um, but it was the most traumatic thing. I was buying my parents a house, you know, Did like you ever my world. get an answer as to why they just, because you had Simon uh, Carroll rooting for you, right? Yeah. Everything just stopped. I think there were things going on in the record company that I didn't know about. There were politics going on. There's a producer that's written a book, a record producer that's written a book with some insights into what I didn't know. And he's told me I haven't yet got the book, but there was a lot going on behind the scenes. Yeah. I, what am I doing with my hands? There was a lot going on behind the scenes. Magic. <laughs> Juggling. Yeah. Um, there was a lot going on behind the scenes that I didn't. You know, we were... We were flying all over the world. You know, when you're in the bubble, yes. when you're in the bubble, the politics, you don't get to see what's going on in the offices. You don't right. really get to tune into real life in the, the business. Talent don't always see, you know, you're the 
face of it, you're, you're, you know, getting the ticket sales, record sales, all this other, but you don't know all this crazy because stuff that's usually, going on. You're usually in a studio till three in the morning or you're right. writing or you're on a plane or you're having photo sessions. And I know that sounds amazing and glamorous. And believe me, I wouldn't have missed that for the world. Sure. But you don't, you're not in the office getting the phone calls, seeing what's really going on, you know? So it ended very badly. And I took it very badly and I had a nervous breakdown. I, um, I, I, I blamed myself. I, uh, sure. I fell apart. I, I just had a breakdown and my mum and dad, very normal people. They didn't really know how to handle it. They had no experience in the music business who I couldn't go to my union. I couldn't go to my, uh, HR in the music business. I couldn't go to Elton John. I didn't know him, you know? I felt very much alone and I went into a state of shock and I lost everything. It was the most horrific. And the worst thing I lost was my confidence. Um, Did that I happen to Paul as well? Did both of you sort of? Paul and I never spoke again. That was it. Yeah, yeah that was it. I saw him after that at, uh, in town, but we never spoke again. It, it completely, he gave up. Before, I mean, he did some performing straight away, but since then he's more in the studio now. I think he's, I think he said that he just likes being behind the scenes. Whereas me, I want, you know, I lost my confidence and I, I kind of blamed myself. And I know that might sound really irrational, but when you're exhausted, um, sometimes you can't see the wood for the trees. And I went into myself and um, I didn't sing again. Um, I ended up after about a year or two going to New York. And nobody knew me in New York. We'd not released in the States. We'd recorded in L.A. with Michael J. We'd been to the Grammys. I love L.A. We'd, we'd been fantastic. But we'd never, we'd not recorded and uh, we'd not released in the States as yet. So we were, I was safe. So I could walk around New York and I didn't have that crushing burden of the word failure on my shoulders because I felt, I just felt it was all my fault. It, I was a failure. And I, I kind of walked around New York and completely forgot and it, it was a relief to forget. I mean, I'd been on the road for four years. I was exhausted. You know, I didn't know whether I was coming or going. And I was incredibly hurt. And I, um, I just didn't believe in myself anymore as a singer and as an artist. So I was with friends in New York and I fell in love with New York. I absolutely, I walked, I, I walked Manhattan. It was like a therapy for me, genuinely. You know, you know nobody, in those days, nobody cycled around. I walked Manhattan. It was like I would just go out during the day. I wasn't working. I just walked. I saw friends. And I just slowly started to heal because I was in a totally different environment. One day I was on 34th Street and it was snowing. And I bumped into this guy and I knocked. He had, he had a box in his hand and I, and I knocked it out of his hand. And uh, I said, oh, I'm so sorry. You know, typical Brit. So sorry. So sorry. And he stood up and he went, it's OK. He said, you're British. And I said, yeah. And he said, what do you do? And I said, why? And he said, well, no, he said, it's just that I'm a playwright and I've written a play. And he said, I'm at a studio tonight and we're doing a rehearsed reading. And it's actually got a British character in and we don't have a British actor. And I, it was one, another one of those moments, like the, like the ragtime moment, you know, where you think, like the old Vic, like you think something's good happening here. Go with it. And I said, well, as it happens, I, and I nearly said, I was an actor because I, I didn't think of myself as any, and it, seriously, I genuinely didn't think of myself as worth anything at that time. And I said, well, I, 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 um, I, yeah, I've done some acting and singing. I didn't say what I'd been in. So I went to the studio, gave me the, the, the script and I read, I had a lovely time as an evening. It was great. It was, I just had a lovely time. I read it. I thought I gave him my phone number. We had coffees and chats and I disappeared. I was staying with my friend in Queens. Three days later, there was a message on the voicemail. Can you call me back? And I rang him back and he said, we'd love you to do this. We're doing a workshop production. It's three months over the summer. We're going to perform it off off Broadway. We'd love you to be in it. Well, you could have knocked me down with a feather. It was like medicine. So not only am I in this amazing city, 
you know, the kid from England, Sky, Sky. I was like watching a TV set, you know. I know if you live in New York, it's like me, I live in London. People talk about Buckingham Palace. You go, yeah, Buckingham Palace. When you live somewhere, it's, it doesn't feel special. But right. for me, you know, I was running away from the biggest nightmare of my life. I'd had a nervous breakdown. This was me This was somebody giving me honey by the spoonful. I was getting Guinness from my Irish ancestors. Right. So I, I joined this, this troupe, these actors, these New York, wonderful New York actors who all had day jobs because you have to. Every night I'd walk. I then moved to Chelsea. No, I then moved to, it was not the posh bit of Chelsea. It was a bit <laughs> over that side, you know, like 9th and 10th Avenue side. And um, I would walk every day at five o'clock all the way up. 7th Avenue, I think it was, or 8th Avenue, to the rehearsal studios, which were quite a well-known, they're up metal staircases, a walk up. And for three months, we rehearsed. Do you know what? It was like somebody was giving me therapy because I never mentioned yell. I never told anybody I'd been a singer. Nobody knew who I was and nobody gave a damn. And that, to me, that was better than lying on a bench and saying, tell me your life story. Right. So I did that. We performed it. And, you know, I started to go to auditions and then I went to L.A. and then I came back to England and, um, you know, I felt like a human being again. And then I went back to America again. I did an episode of Passions in uh, in L.A. I what lived was in that L.A. Like during Passions? You know what? Well, when I lived in L.A., it's so different. I mean, you know, everybody knows L.A. and New York are very, very different. The strange thing is um, I'd had this agent in New York. And when I eventually went back to New York, to L.A., I called her up because she'd become a bi-coastal agent. Fantastic. I didn't have to do what everybody does in L.A. and search for an agent. You know, bear in mind, I told nobody I sung. Nobody knew about my group. So they just think I'm this jobbing actor, which was fine. You know, no questions. I don't have to explain myself. No pain. You know, you, you can put it in a little box somewhere and never think about it. You know, right. I think a lot of people do that with traumas in their lives because yes. then you can live. You know, right. so basically um, I go and see the agent in L.A. I couldn't have gone on. Listen to this. I turn up in in, uh, in L.A. L.A. It never rains. Props in February. You know, I turn up in L.A. and I've signed up to do this acting week of acting workshops. And I'm in the valley. I'm in Sherman Oaks. And uh, the agent, of course, is way over in, in Hollywood. And I have to find now bear in mind. I know nobody. So I have to find my way from Sherman Oaks to Hollywood. Don't know anybody, no car. And it was strangely enough. So I get up on the morning and I get directions. Somebody gives me the complete wrong directions. I get on the wrong bus. I get on this bus that takes me across, but it takes me down to Compton. Oh, yeah. So I'm in Compton, nearly get shot in Compton. I'm not joking. I'm serious. I get on the wrong bus, drama after drama, eventually get on the right bus, but it's raining cats and dogs. It's not just raining cats and dogs. They've brought Noah's Ark with them, right? LA is having this flash flood for 24 hours. I eventually arrive at the agent's office via Compton, via ducking, getting on the wrong bus. And I turn up at the agent's office two minutes before she's closing. And you know, they're not too pleased if you're four hours late for, a, for an appointment. Anyway, I managed to explain everything to her. I looked, can you imagine, you know, when you turn up an agent, you're like, you know, you yeah. know, yeah. I looked like, I didn't just look like a drowned rat. I looked like we, I'd been a drowned rat that had been pushed through a bush backwards and dragged down <laughs> again. You know, I, I mean, no, no, talk about, anyway. So anyway, so she signed me back up again. The she next album is going to be titled Anyway. That's going yeah. to be the next title for you Anyway. <laughs> She signs me up. <laughs> Three days later, I get a call, go to Passions for an audition. I turn up. My mate gives me a lift in the car because I don't have a car yet. You know, we're in Sherman Oaks. Thankfully, the audition is only in Studio City. That's where Passions used to be shot. I yes. turn up. Oh, my God. The studio. It's, they've got like Lucille Ball Avenue and Desi Arnaz Road. Oh, yes. Studios. You know, like this is the boy that had been on the soundstage with Jimmy Cagney. I'm now in Hollywood. Bear in mind, you know, I was at school. My girlfriend, Michelle, and I always thought we'd been born on the wrong continent. You know, I always thought I should have been born in America. You know, and what the heck? I think, you know, the, the um, it isn't a swan. What's that bird that drops the babies? The um, 
The stork. Anyway, they dropped me in the wrong the stork. The stork. I think the stork got lost. You know, with me, I should have been born on the on, in the states. So anyway, I'm in the audition for Passions, and of course, every Brit in town's in there. You know, every everybody. I sat next to this guy, and I'm chatting away. And I said, "Have you come far?" And he said, "Yeah." He said, "My truck's outside." He'd driven from Arizona for the audition. That's what they do. You know, people. Yeah. In a way, I think what I like about the states is. They like people who work hard. They, they've got this work ethic. You know, they reward hard work. You know, if you put the effort in, there are opportunities. It's very different in the UK. You know, there's, we have something here called a class system, and we've grown up with it. You know, it's just very different. You don't have a class system in the States. And, you know, I'm sitting next to a truck driver. I'm going in to read with somebody that, you know, is a garbage collector because the guy is also an actor, but he's got to earn a crust. Anyway. I go, I arrive with my friend. He's waiting in the in the uh, car park for me. I go in and I've learned the lines. I do the scene, but they say nothing. They say, lovely casting directors, but they don't say a word. So I leave and I think, oh, well, you know, never mind. You've had the audition. It's probably not going to work out. I leave, but unlike when I was at Yentl, I walked right around the studios. They were shooting CSI in New York there. I mean, come on, I might never get a chance to go back in again, you know? So I have a good little look around the studios, jump in the car with my friend, and there's a post office right on right at Studio City on the corner, just around the block. There's a new stand opposite that is the post office. My friend, my roommate, needs some stamps. He goes in. Now, bear in mind, I've just left the TV studio in, in Studio City. I just left there four minutes ago. We pull around the corner. I'm still in that. How did I do? They didn't say anything. Do you think I got it? My phone rings. It's my agent. You booked the job. Can you imagine? I get out of the car. I go in. My mate's like in, in the line four up. And I'm, I'm trying to mind to him. I've booked the job. He thinks I've lost the plot. You know, he thinks I'm trying to order <laughs> Chinese food or something, you know? Right. So I get back in the car. I then phone my mother. Of course, I forget. It's three in the morning in England. I'm in L.A. You know, it's like, you know, they're asleep. So I ring my mother, wake my mother up and I went, I've booked the job. Well, you, what you've got to realize is this is the kid that lost everything, had a breakdown. And I'm in L.A. and I've booked a job on a show. Come on. Yeah. First booking, first job. You know, I should have just, you know, I should have been born in. I mean, I was meant to be over there, you know. So yeah. my love for the States, love New York love la but i know there's a whole different country in the middle upstate all over the place love it you know i've traveled around a bit i you know i'd be there tomorrow if i could but of course we got locked down locked i came back to england i was doing well in the states but my mum was ill my dad wasn't very well and i know it might sound strange to people but we were very close family and i came back to england that's beautiful never thinking never thinking that I would end up becoming my mum's carer. And my mum and dad were not very well. My dad went into a facility and my mum was on her own and I moved in with my mum. I moved to her town, her city, and I just took care of my mum. And um, I know it sounds strange, but I just, I didn't miss the career. And, and, and you've just seen how passionate I am about my career. But that's my mum. I, I can not leave her. You know, especially right. after the birth, after the way, after the struggle she had when she had me, you know. Uh, I couldn't, you know, I was, it's really strange. You know, I joked at the beginning of this when I said, you said something, you know, are you the youngest, the oldest? And I said, no, I was a mistake. That I really was unplanned. But I think maybe my mum's mum planned me because she knew someone was going to need to keep an eye on my mum. Take care of because, her, her daughter, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so... Because strangely enough, I, I believe in the afterlife. I believe in the other side. I once went to see a clairvoyant. Uh, and I've been to see a few. And she told me I I was I, I um, nearly had a child several years ago. It didn't happen. And the clairvoyant said to me that your grandmother is holding your son in her arms. Mm. So, you know, I hope it's true because it, I did, you know, that. That never happened. That could have happened, and it, I, you know, it's very emotional when she told me that because you know I wanted my son in my arms. You know, I'd love to have brought my son up. It's heartbreaking, you know. But to know that my my mum had me, 
this is the strangest thing. And my grandmother died very shortly after I was born. And my grandmother was going to hold me at the font. So when the clairvoyant told me that my grandmother was holding my son that didn't you know, happen in her arms, it kind of fell into place because she was going to hold me at the font. So I tended to believe what was told, you know. Yeah, sure. Anyway, yeah. you can see how passionate I am about my family. So I wasn't going to fly off. I couldn't, you know, I love the States. And I loved my career. I got, you know, I got a job in a TV show first, but first one out the bat. But I got my Screen Actors Guild. You know, um, I couldn't leave my mum. I couldn't leave her on her own. So I basically moved in with my mum and looked after her. She progressively needed more and more help. So I moved her to my home in London, and I moved her in with me, and um, I looked after her. She actually, my mum passed away on my sofa. Um, I looked after her for 10 years and my mum would get angry with me when I looked, she didn't get angry with me because I was looking after her badly. She would get, sometimes I'd, um, she'd say, you never sing. And I say, no, because I, after yell, I never sung. I just, I just never, I just, I just didn't believe in myself. Didn't believe in myself at all. And I never sung. I, I don't know whether it was because I associated pain with it and the x factor came on britain's got talent came on american idol came on do you know i could watch those shows as a as a punter as a member of the public i yeah. never watched them i never watched them as an artist that's how much i put it in a box in my head i yeah. totally disassociated myself and my mom it must have been so frustrating for her because she'd kind of occasionally see me in the in my apartment breaking into song and she'd get really angry and she'd say, you should be there. You know, she still, she still felt the passion that yeah. I had. I didn't feel it. And she used to get angry and say, you shouldn't be looking after me. You should be doing that. You should be in America. You should be, you were there. You, you've given it all up for me and you're wasting your life. And I said, no, 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 I'm here and I won't be going anywhere. And I loved it. You know, I, I wouldn't miss that for the world. But, you know, the day my mum passed away, uh, oh, never really talk about this, but um, she put her hand on mine at the side of the bed and she said, um, you're my best pal. And I said, nah, don't be silly. I'm, I'm your son. I mean, she was, you know, she was saying, she, you know, I said, no, I, I'm your son. And she put her hand on my phone. She went, no, you've been my best pal. Thank you for everything. And we got up we, and, I, and I gave her a hug and we had, we had breakfast and we got on with the rest of the day and she was sitting on my sofa and, and she just had some scrambled eggs for lunch. It wasn't the scrambled eggs. And um, she just stopped breathing. She just took her last breath. I mean, people say if there's a way to go, you know, you're not hooked up to things in hospital, you know, you're not whatever. And she, she, I, I, we had the most amazing 10 years. My mum had had a tough life. And when I moved her in with me, I was determined that, she just have a fabulous 10 years. I took, you know what? I took a couple of auditions. She'd get so angry with me. My agent would ring and I'd say, no, I'm not doing it. Do you know what? I took a couple of auditions to please my agent. Because if you leave your agent, getting an agent back, you know, it's like trying to get an audience with the Pope. Actually, talking to the Pope, when my mum was well, I took her to Rome. She was 82. I took her to Rome. We walked Rome. We, she, we had a ball. Anyway, getting back to the story, I took a, I, I just wanted to give her joy because she'd had such a tough life. I tried to fill the 10 years with, I didn't know it was going to be 10 years. Could have been 10 weeks when I, when, I, when I moved her in with me. Could have been 10 months. I didn't care. It was open-ended. But we just had a great time. All my friends loved her, but I didn't sing. I didn't do anything apart from occasionally. My agent would ring me and I didn't want to lose my agent. And my mum would say, um, my mum would say, go, go. Do you know what I did? I would take my mum to auditions. My mom, I went to Coronation Street, British show. I'd been in it and I took my mum a few years later to another audition. Um, big show, been on since 1960. Well, I took my mum to Manchester. I went and she was sitting in reception. I went up to do the audition. I came down, she's sit, only sitting on the sofa chatting with one of the major characters. Yeah, I thought they were going to put her in the soap. You yeah. know, that's the kind of easygoing, lovely, lovely. Well, I'll put the photograph down. But that's the kind of easygoing, smashing woman she was. She was just a charmer, you know. Anyway, so I took her to a. Can you bring of that closer to the uh, camera so we really see you, her? I'll email it to you. 
That's Winifred Catherine. She was a smasher. Anyway, and so. She got the guards to smile, which is rare. <laughs> yeah, like the Queen. She had a lovely smile. It's funny, looking at the Queen in her last years, because, you know, you get old Did and you friendly. feel some sort of connection yeah, with your mother genuinely. and with her? Yeah. I genuinely did, especially as we'd it, been to Buckingham Palace. It and reminded there was you lovely, of, uh, yeah, yeah wonderful ladies. So I took my mum to a couple of auditions, but I I just filled her days with, we, we would, I would take her out, we would walk. I would, you know, in the in the last year, she ended up in a wheelchair because her, her, she broke her pelvis. Mm -hmm. I would push her. We, we'd, get, we'd go somewhere, like we'd go to Hampstead or we'd go to Mid Pem, um, Primrose Hill. And then I'd walk her back, but we'd always go the interesting routes. So basically, and a friend of mine said, you know what you're doing, don't you? And I said, no. And he, and he said, what you put in your career, you're putting into looking after your mum. And I thought nothing of it. Well, that's what you do. You know, you love someone, you care for them. So I had a great time. I mean, it's hard work, don't get me wrong, you know, but I wouldn't have missed it for the world. You know, to watch your mum get frailer and frailer is not easy. As yeah. Betty Davis used to say, getting older ain't for sissies, you know. Yeah. And my mum didn't want to get older and frail. It was frustrating for her. But, you know, my mum would, as I say, get angry. And she said to me, it's, uh, the day that she died, when she said, you're a power, we were sitting. And she said to me, it's, you know, it's not going to be easy when I've gone. And I said, I know. I said, I'm going to grieve. You know, it's going to be hard, you know. And she said, no, no, no. She says, I can see the future and it's going to be tough you for a while she said you can't walk away from your career like you haven't expect to get it back she says you won't it's going to be tough and i and i i kind of laughed it off you know because i didn't i didn't realize so my mum passes away on my sofa i put her on the floor and i do the compressions and the kiss of life and i managed to get her heart beating again because i didn't want her to die mm -mm. you know I, it's kind of selfish, really. I think sometimes when you're a child, sometimes when your parents are very old and frail, it's hard for you to let them go. Absolutely. Really hard. So she'd stop. She just closed her eyes. I mean, what a peaceful way to go. But I did the thing and I got her heart beating again and we got her to hospital. And then I got round to the hospital. And they wouldn't let me on. They wouldn't let me in to see her. My God, it was so painful. I was pacing around the hospital. You know, they wouldn't let me in to see it. And eventually I was banging on the door and the doors were closed electronically. Anyway, they let me in the ward and um, my mum was lying on the bed. And um, I just looked and I just thought, you know, this, this isn't the way forward. And um, I leaned down. I mean, I was pleased to see her and I was relieved she was there. But I whispered in her ear and I just said, um, it's me. I love you, mum. But your mum's waiting for you. And I said where they used to live as a child. And I said, she's at the door. And she's got her arms open and she's waiting for you. Don't worry about me. You go. It's all right. I said, but I will be trying to get in touch with you when you've gone. I said, so. Keep your ears open for me because I'll be I'll be looking for you, you know. I said, but go. Go. Don't wait any longer. That's beautiful. Anyway, no, you know no, no, I stood up. I stood up. Yeah. My aunt was there. Yeah. And the doctors the doctors are there. The... She went. Now, she'd been lying there for two hours. I couldn't get in to the beep, beep, beep. They wouldn't let me in. I mean, I was pulling my head. Bear in mind, I'd looked after this one for 10 years. You know what yeah. I mean? And I, I could not that part, how they do that. Yeah. Anyway, they let me in. And I said to her, please, I'm going. It's okay. I love you. But go. Because you know what? There comes a time when you've got to let go. You've got to not be selfish. The child in you never wants to lose a parent. You don't want to lose your dad. You don't want to lose your brother. You know. You never want them to go, but you've got to be the adult. And I've been the adult looking after her because after a while, when you're looking after somebody elderly, the roles get reversed. Yeah, they really do. I'm the child. Not, that she, not that she was childlike, but you, uh, when you take responsibility, you make the decisions sometimes for them, you know, right. and they begin to rely on you to do that. So I kissed her. 
I mean, I'd whispered in her ear, you know, I mean, how close can you be? And of course, I didn't want her to go, but I, and I kissed her and I stood up and without a word of a lie, it went beep and she went. And I, she'd been waiting for me to get through that door. She just wanted to know that I was all right and that I'd be OK. I haven't told anybody this publicly before, so forgive me if this is hard for anyone to listen to. I'm so sorry. No, I didn't mean to expose so I much of you to share. What I well, was, no, I, I'm, I'm, a little bit, I'm a little bit surprised at myself for being this open. I'm in a bit of a comfortable and no, it's there's a uh, it's very interesting because as you're talking, you know, it's all in how you per, your perspective there is a little ray of shine. Do you see it at the top there of your screen coming out of the doorway? Really? Like a little blue shine of light right on the top of the doorway to the right of you up above. No, I, I can't see it here, but maybe it's I'm not meant to see it. Almost like an angelic light that's coming in from the other room, uh, coming over, pointing yeah, towards you. I'm just going to take another angle and see if I can see it. Maybe if I close this. No, it's great. It's perfect because maybe, maybe that was a sign from your mother. Well, it just, you know, it just I don't want to give any way. I don't want to give any secrets away because everyone has their own way of dealing with things. It was beautiful. In the couple of weeks before my mum passed away, I used to hear her chatting away in, in bed, and I truly got the impression that people from the other side. I mean, people probably think I'm balmy. But, you know, that, that that she was being visited and that she was getting prepared to go. Because right. my mum my mom slipped away so peacefully and so I'm so pleased that she did. Because yeah. some people have a terrible time, you know. Yeah. The hardest thing for me was letting go. For, for my mum, she was going to her mum. She was going to her mum and her family, you know. But with. for me, the intensity of me looking, when you look after someone, I mean, it's hard for anybody to lose a parent. But when you look after somebody with the intensity that I did, because I looked after her 24-7, and I didn't realise when I did it how difficult it would be for me afterwards, because, boy, was my mother right. Of course, mothers are always right. I, I re Afterwards, I, I felt like I was being kicked by a horse every day. Of course. I'd lost, yeah. my, I'd lost my identity. I didn't know who I was. was traumatic response, yeah. Who was I? Was I a carer? Where, who was I caring for? Was I, I wasn't a singer anymore, wasn't that? What, what was that? I totally lost myself. So yet again, like after Yellen did very abruptly, I was suddenly in this very strange place where I was in a blackness. And you know, people, the public, were probably wondering, where's Daniel James? Where? Well, maybe some of them were thinking, thank God, you know, <laughs> that whiny old goat. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the thing is, I... It took a while, but I threw myself into um, pulling myself together. I, 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 what I'd done is, although I'd moved my mum in with me, I actually then moved her back to where she lived. And before she died, I wanted her to be where she was born. You know, I talk about my granddad being a shipwright carpenter and, you know, the great family and kinship my mum had in Sunderland. And I'm very proud of Hartlepool and I'm very proud of the Northeast and Sunderland. And I wanted my mum to go back and be among her family. So I moved everything up there. And so when my mum passed away, I then stayed up there and I, I was lost. And I used to walk. I used to go. There's a river there called the River Weir. It's a bit like a very dark, big river like, um, like in New York, you know. And um, I walked every night. I would go out for long. I'm a great, like, like I walk New York, you know, like I walked LA. I'm, that's how I, that's my therapy exercise and walking and it's proved to be the best therapy for me because i i um you know what i did when i was in the northeast i to cope with my grief i learned to ride a motorbike never i took i took i, I got i found this place to talk because i thought i need some new skills i mean i was a bit crazy i need some new skills so i went on this course Blooming freezing, the northeast of England, I'm being in, on the North Pole, and I'm learning on this motorbike. My hands were blue, my nose, I was like Rudolph the Red Nosed Reindeer gone wrong, <laughs> you know. But I learned to ride a motorbike over months, and then I took up, I learned how to ride a horse because I, I, I didn't know what to do with myself, I was lost. So I just thought, and I know it's crazy, learn some new skills. So I learned how I went horse, I learned how, I mean, I wasn't bad, I was, you know, I mean, I'm not, not running races, but you know, if Downton ring. I can, you know, you know, I can get on a horse. But anyway, I probably end up cleaning the horse. Never mind. No, probably give the part of the one cleaning the shoes. But anyway, 
my, but anyway. my main, <laughs> what I learned from see when I grew up when we had trauma and grief in the house my mother always worked through it and that's right, my right. therapy working through things working through things. so basically um I took up those challenges to keep my mind occupied and then I came back to London and I thought I've got no career I've got no life what am I going to do and before I know it we had lockdown so I retract I learned to ride a motorbike I learned to ride a horse I trained as a fitness instructor teaching body attack Les Mills body attack which was almost like performing because you're standing at the front of a class and you're you're teaching classes to music so somehow the little performer in me was sneaking out there but disguised as a teacher so you know looking back i think that was a little bit of um, adrenaline for me because when you're teaching this class your adrenaline's flying with the time you get to track seven or track eight so then lockdown happens nothing i'm on my own in london i've got friends but all my friends are miles away you can't see anyone so what i used to do on a night i go for long here we go with the walking again you know i should be up a mountain with sherpa tenzing um <laughs> so basically every night i go for walks in the pitch black there's nobody on the street because believe me in the first lockdown everyone in the uk obeyed and i really mean they obeyed so I went out for a walk. I didn't go shopping, didn't do anything like that. I'd save all my time up and every night I'd go for long walks and I'd walk miles up to North London, up to Archway, to Primrose Hill, to, 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 to Hampstead Heath, like on my own. And you know what? I started to write songs in my head. I was out one night and the pace of my, I walk quite quickly because it's aerobic and I was walking and suddenly in your heart, in your soul, I feel it in my bones every night, every day. I lie awake and say, I've got to let you go now. And I started to write, set your spirit free. Well, I haven't got my phone with me. I haven't got a recorder with me. So I turn on my, I haven't written a song. I haven't written a song in decades. You know, like years had gone by. I'd, I'd never sung before. I ran back to my apartment. I got in the apartment, got my phone, and I sang in my heart. In my soul, I feel it in my bones every night, every day. I lie awake and say, I've got to let you go now. And I wrote the chorus. The next, or did I write the verse? I can't remember which way around it came. So I go to bed. Because if you, when you write a song, if you don't, if you go to bed, you'll wake up, you won't, you won't remember it. So I whacked the melody down on the phone. I went to bed. Got up the next day. I listened to it. The day went on. The night came. Out I go on the walk again. There's only me and a fox. Seriously. I, I saw one fox. I used to see this fox every night. He'd stand in the middle of the road and stare at me. It was almost like he was Clint Eastwood and I was the foe. He'd almost look at me and go, what are you doing on my street? Seriously. Confident little fox. Anyway, I'd walk. So the second night I wrote the, I wrote the verse on the first night, the chorus on the second night, and then got it recorded, got it in the house, and basically started to write songs again. This is the guy that never thought he'd sing again. I mean, I'm only singing them into my phone. There's no technology here. Anyway, lockdown goes on. By the end of lockdown, I've got half a dozen songs. We come out. We start to be able to do things again. I go in a studio. Can you imagine my fear? Can you imagine my nerves? You know, I... You know, when Yell ended, I'm not going to go into the whys and wherefores, but there was one sentence said to me that pushed me over the edge into a breakdown. Bear in mind when you're an exhausted man and somebody sits you into an office and says, you're old, you're ugly, and you're untalented, and you'll never work again, not even on the end of the pier. Now, when it's like somebody, that rugby uh, guy again. Yeah, yeah well... I was that was told to me in a very harsh way when I was at the lowest ebb in my life. And that pushed me into having a nervous breakdown. You can see why I never wanted to sing again. Oh, you know, maybe I should have reacted like I did to the, the, the rugby teacher and say, well, I won't give you the finger, but you know what I mean? Yeah, but I didn't because I was worn down. You were I just already did the world for four years. I, you know, my love of my life was my band, you know? So. I wrote these songs and I booked a studio. Can you imagine when I put the cans on my head, the cans of your earphones, 
And that music started. I wasn't even sure I could knock a note out. I wasn't even sure I'd be any good. And I started to sing. I couldn't believe it. it I, I, I kicked myself. I got the first verse out and I got the course. I didn't. And the guy stopped because he said, oh, we're just we're just practicing, you know, just a little warm up. And I went, no, don't stop. I might not be able to do it again. And I and he played. He said, don't be silly. You know, I mean, the guy didn't know my trauma and he played it back to me and I listened. And I remembered my mum doing this and saying, you should be singing. You should be working. You shouldn't do this. You should be in America. You should be performing. And um, I kicked myself. I thought, why have you left it so long? Why did you do this to yourself? And I realized nobody had held me back. Yes, they'd said those things to me. Yes, I was broken. You know, they shouldn't have. And yes, they broke me. But why did I leave it so long? Why did I believe them? Why did I allow them to crucify me? And, and you know what? You can't you can't just step back into a career. You know, it's not there on a plate. You're not entitled. Yeah, you had it once. Who says you're going to have it again? You know what I mean? Sometimes people have five minutes, 10 minutes, 20 minutes, 20 years. What you get, grab it, hold it, love it, keep it, because it can be taken away so quickly like it was with me. So just because I'm singing in a studio doesn't mean anyone's going to want to listen. doesn't mean anyone's going to care. But you know what? I just thought, you stopped yourself, and it was me. So for all those people watching, if you've been bad, and I'm not doing this preachy thing, you know, that I'm on Oprah or whatever, because this is just about me, but from my experience, from my limited experience, don't let anybody. If someone beats you down, it's more about them. I know why these people beat me down. I know why they did it. At the time, I was so emotionally involved. I didn't have anyone to help me, and I believed them. I was exhausted. I was tired. Like the thing that I loved was taken away from me. Don't listen to people. If they want to beat you down, don't listen because it's them. It's their problem, not yours. And I wish I'd had somebody to take me aside, to put their arms around me and say, no, you can sing. You are talented. I didn't. You know, I didn't go to my parents. I didn't want to worry them. I wish I'd had somebody to, to do this to me then. And right. for anybody young that's had, that's been battered, whether it's in a relationship, whether it's in any kind of job, it doesn't matter. Don't let them beat you down. You, you deserve better. And it's their problem, not yours. But I didn't know that at the time. I didn't know it. I was too tired. I was too vulnerable. So when I heard myself singing back, it was like, wow, why did I do this? Why did I leave it so long? Why did I leave it? You know, I've wasted all these years. I'm not believing in myself. And now I'm singing all the time. I mean, I'm, I'm not singing very well tonight because I'm emotional. But, you know, so I wrote, I wrote the songs about, um, I'm changing the subject quickly because I don't want to get emotional. Set Your Spirit Free was about people in lockdown because when the world turns its head, there are people around me with their hearts in their mouths, not knowing the right way they should turn, watching hair turning grey. Seeing children turn into adults, days rolling away. It's falling apart at the seams. Well, that's what happened in lockdown. Those things were happening. And in my heart, in my soul, I feel it in my bones every night, every day. I lie awake and say, they've got, got to let us go now. They've got to set our spirits free. And eventually, we set our, our spirits were set free and we could live again. And that was what Set Your Spirit Free was about. And he came, I released, I recorded it and I released it. And little radio stations picked up on me and started to play it. And there was a guy called Mike Reed in the UK. He was he's a big radio DJ, big TVs, had TV quiz shows. And he has something called the Heritage Chart, the heritagechart.co.uk. And it's a chart for people who were pop stars in the 70s, 80s, 90s. And He's, that chart is for people who had hits then and are bringing out releases now. And Set Your Spirit Free got into the top 20. Can you imagine how exciting that was for me? Doing radio and TV interviews again. The boy that never thought he'd sing again. 
you know i mean genuinely and um imagine how sad i was that my mom and dad weren't here to see me god my mom must have been she was like this only days before she passed away anyway set your spirit free came out then i did don't want to lose that girl well for don't want to lose that girl restrictions were loosened i did a little ballad and as you've seen on there jim i do a little shimmy yeah that's and, right um it is only a shimmy um <laughs> and uh, <laughs> jimmy shimmy little, yeah shimmy jimmy and um and that got into the heritage chart as well and i got more airplay and you know got some magazine articles and stuff like that things started to happen again and then i stepped back for a while and i've just released do you remember me because i was in a two reasons really one because i'd been away and i wondered if people remembered me but also i was in a supermarket um quite a while ago and i spotted an x across the aisle you know and some people see an x and they want to run a mile you know some people see an x and they're like hey you owe me money you know we all have experiences with x's i saw this x and and i i i felt fondly for her still i'd ended the relationship it wasn't anything bad or whatever but i'd ended it a while ago and i saw her and i for a moment this little film ran in my head of the good times i thought wow and it was like should i have ended it you know was i a bit hasty but then thankfully after a couple of minutes the other film started to show of the you know like you're seeing on the video now the arguments the disagreements they'd be unhappy because sometimes you only remember the good times you know sometimes people remember the bad anyway i went home she, she hadn't seen me thank god and um I chatted to some friends about it and they all had different stories in their heads. They um some of them had bumped into exes and been friends. Some had, couldn't stand the sight of them. Everyone had a different story about what that feeling was about bumping into an ex or seeing an ex from a distance. So I went away and, and wrote, wrote about it. And that's what do you remember me about? There I am sitting in the shelter on the in the video on the south coast. We had a fantastic summer in the UK this year. That was filmed on the southeast coast of England, and we had a beautiful day. I'm sitting in a in a little shelter on the seafront, and I'm telling the story of the song, just there, you know, talking about the times we shared, the fun we had, but it's all over now, and you know, in time, we'll be glad that we let it go. So I tend to write my. You can see that I'm quite a passionate person. I tend to write songs about my life experiences, yes. experiences this of also friends. Part. It, does it also, when I hear it too, do you remember me now? It's almost as if I'm Daniel James, I'm back. Maybe you knew me from Yale. Maybe you knew me from television and film and other things I've done. I, there's been a pause. There's been things in my life I had to deal with that are very important to me. Do you remember me now? I'm back. I'm here. Maybe. It, yeah. I mean, I wouldn't it's, say it's, I wouldn't it's say ironic it, maybe. That that's the title too, because mm. it sort of fits beautifully the fact that here you are doing your thing, finding your voice again, getting back in, expressing yourself with a newfound look at life. I think it's uh it's perfect. Do you remember me now? The timing maybe, of it. Yeah. Maybe there's a little bit in there of yeah. also um saying to myself you're here again because it's my third track and it's like there's a little bit of me going yeah yeah you know yeah i'm here again you know and start to enjoy it i think i in, i really enjoy this song and this video because although it's a song about a story it's actually a very upbeat track it's a the, you know the rhythms the layers the vocals the harmonies and the music it's, it's a happy track it's not a sad track or anything. In and in, you. in you see me dancing in the video on the rocks yeah. and stuff, I want it to be uplifting because you know what? I really enjoyed the experience of making this video. And I want I hope that people will enjoy it as well. Because although I've told some sad stories about my life, they happen to be true. I've also had some great times. And I'm yes. I'm so grateful to have this second bite of the cherry. Absolutely. I mean, who knew? I certainly didn't know. You know, I would never yeah. have guessed this was going to happen in a million years. It's like winning the lottery. Kind yes. Of. Yes, absolutely. But, but yes. Not quite the big prize yet, but I'm, you know, certainly on the way. 
taking a bite of the cherry. I'm going to write that one down. We don't use that one here. We say taking a bite um, out of the apple, but the cherry uh, sounds good uh, too. Well, you know, cherries are a little sweet. <laughs> you know, cherries are sweeter and cherries softer. Cherries are sweeter, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, take a, sec a second bite of the cherry. I'm getting a second bite of the cherry because you know what? The first bite is beautiful, and to yeah. get a second bite, oof. So, yeah, I'm very fortunate that, Are that you, uh... old, old Yale fans, and I don't mean old in age, I mean no. Yale fans yeah. are still supporting me. Their kids yes. are coming along, and new fans That's are coming beautiful. along saying, who's this old geezer groaning on in this song? Who's oh. this old guy? <laughs> Are you able to sing a little bit of it for us so they can hear Please, the voice? Yeah. Don't stay the same. And now you're gone. I've got to move on. It feels strange inside. We shared so much. It plays on my mind. It's beautiful. Well, it's something. I mean, I'm a little bit husky because I've been emoting. I've been telling you my, I mean, you know, I'm telling you my life story. And I thought we we're coming in for like a little chat and I've poured my heart out. I'm a little bit, I'm a little bit drained, you know, as Bonnie, as, um, as, uh, what's her name would say, wrote Jolene. I'm a little bit yeah. country. I'm a little bit rock and roll. I'm a little bit, I'm a little bit husky now, you know. <laughs> Do you remember me? Yeah, you know, it's. Um, Take a sip of the tea that you got there. That's now iced tea. <laughs> Can I just say, it's my, it, you know, Americans would say, your tea looks cold, sir. <laughs> well, it is, but because I'm Northern, I don't care. No tea, cold right. tea, what hot tea? tea that's give it. me tea. Just give you know? me tea. <laughs> yeah. You know, as, as he would say, you know, ice, ice, baby. Tea, tea, baby. That's <laughs> So do you see more music coming from Daniel James? Could we expect well, you know more? It's really, st I've got a couple of more tracks, but someone said to me, um, is it not time for a, like an upbeat, happy song? Because um, I think I've tended to write about my recent experiences and stuff. Sure, yeah. So, um, yeah, there's some more, yes, not yet. Yes, there's some more music, Jim. But I may not release what I thought I was going to release. I'm going to try and, knock out kind of up tempo song because yeah. i think it's time that daniel was a little bit in your face happy what do you think yeah, absolutely now, I don't know I'm pull. Hey, listen jim i'm saying this the next time we speak maybe january february it might not have happened so don't lash me if i bring out another ballad you know then you're snoring away but in my mind <laughs> i'm thinking you know come on because one of the fans said to me you know you know daniel you know you can't be happy you know, and I said, well, I am happy. And they said, yeah, but you haven't written a song about being happy. And I said, someone's already done that, you know. Um, but, yeah, I Pharrell think. Pharrell Williams, I mean, right? Yeah. yeah, Pharrell. And, he, you know, yeah. Pharrell was number one in 27 countries with that song and sold over, so far, over 11 million copies. You can yes. tell I do my research. What's the name of my radio show? Bangers and Chat. And they're the kind of facts that come out, in, you know, because I know all the facts about. I do the research. It's fascinating. You'd be yeah. surprised. You know, my lawyer years ago said to me, where there's a hit, there's a writ. Because, you know, you, someone's usually so suing somebody. But you know what? Right. Where, there's a hit, where there's a hit, there's usually a good story as well. And, and also, sometimes, you know, you see someone on TV and you think, wow, they've just arrived overnight. Mm -hmm. uh, quite a lot of people. In fact, 90% of the people have been slogging away behind the scenes for ages beforehand you know yeah right so there exactly. you go so your listeners are probably in a coma by now i've i've talked not at so all long. they're probably in a trance are you kidding you me no, they, we have very the loyal second. listeners you know what our listeners are called i once said that the well i said a couple of times i said the show has a lot of light love and levity and i said it too fast one episode and i stumbled on levity and then the audience jumped on it and they said levity we love that word you're now Mr. Lovety. This is Lovety Hall. We're your Lovety squad, and your guests are part of the Lovety family. So they hey. have already designated you a Gym Master Show Lovety, L O V E I T Y. Do Not grammatically correct. <laughs> do you Lovety me? Exactly. Yes, you do. Are we Lovety together? Yes, we are, Jim. I tell well, you. It doesn't fit, but never mind. I no, can't. I think it's fantastic. Are you kidding me? <laughs> yes, absolutely. Great word, lovely. What a fantastic word. You've I made just, your own word in the dictionary. 
I, I just stumbled on it and I kept, you know. Have you, have you patented that? Maybe, maybe it's the British side of me that was very humble and I kept saying sorry that I, uh, you know, made the mistake of not saying light, love, and levity. And I said levity. And the audience was like, will you stop saying that? It was meant to be. You were supposed to stumble on that. And then I said, well, how do you want to spell it? And uh, you you ask know, too many questions. Just roll with it, baby. <laughs> they said, well, we're in a pandemic at that time. Well, we still are. But in that time, it was thick and, you know, real thick. And they said, don't lose the E in love. Whatever you do, do not drop the E. We want the word love to stay intact. I said, OK, grammatically, this won't be correct. So don't tell your seventh grade grammar teacher. But L-O-V-E-I-T-Y. And they said, yes. All right. So that's. And Listen, you're at Levity on our show. Hey, How cool is that? One of my songs. Don't want to lose that E from Levity. I'm getting corny now. Don't want to lose that E. Talking, you, know? you got Set it. Set my I... Levity free. Set my Levity free. You've got it all. <laughs> I mean, you know, you could do a cover of No Diggity, No Levity. No Diggity, right? <laughs> it's where you hang it. No Levity. No Levity. <laughs> They're gonna send me away in a minute. Seriously, there's a no. there's a jacket there for me. <laughs> a, yeah, the cats are they the cats still outside the door being Listen, calm? They've stopped, cool mating, yeah. they've stopped mating, they're howling now, you know. They haven't eaten in a while. No, no, they're probably gonna be chewing me carpet soon. Oh, those cats are gonna be uh leopards and tigers and cougars. They're like this at the door. Uh. They're not stray cats, baby. <laughs> they're not doing the stray cat strut, I'll tell you. Do you see yourself touring? Hopefully. Um well, I might be doing a gig. It's, it, nobody in the States can see me, but maybe I think I'm going to, I've been offered a support gig in December, uh, the 3rd of December in uh, in the north of England. It's a, quite an artist, a big artist, actually. Um, you know, I'm just this little at the moment, hopefully getting a little this big. But they've offered me a support gig, so I may well be performing in the first week of December. Hey, come on. Who would have thought? That's cool, right? Oh, I got to ask you, what was it like to uh, be in EastEnders, to have an opportunity to be in, in that? Well, there's another story. Listen, I turn up on the lot. It's December. It's snowing. Now, come on, you know England. When it snows, it snows. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's not just coming down cats and dogs. Like I say, nobody's got a second arc, you know? Yeah. So I'm, I walk on the lot. Now, bear in mind, this show has been going for like 30 years oh, it's legendary it's, you know, yeah legendary tv show it made some big stars of people in this country you know um mm -hmm. brian may married to anita dobson who was a huge huge star in that you know and um so i walk on the set and there's a on the lot there's a second-hand car dealership and i've got a knock on the door and um it's snowing it's cold I knocked on the door. We had to do that many rehearsals because they couldn't get the camera angle right. And I'm one of those people, I don't want to fake it. It's got to be real, you know? And it's got to be small, you know, on the camera. You don't, it's not big. You've got to make it real. But you're knocking on the door and I'm playing this really edgy character. So I'm hammering on the door and we do that many takes. By the end of the scene, my knuckle is black and blue. So I go out from the scene because nobody's answering the door. I walk around to the front of the car lot and the character the son of the character I'm looking for. I'm unshaven. I'm playing Cockney. a mean geezer. I'm looking for Phil Mitchell. All right, mate? I'll sort you out. Phil sold me a dodgy motor, and I'm looking for him. So I'm shouting across the lot, and his son Ben comes over. Ben is deaf. I don't know that Ben is deaf. So Ben's coming towards me. I'm walking around the car lot. Where's this geezer? I'm going to sort him out. I'm looking everywhere. And of course, Ben's talking to me. I'm talking to Ben. He can't see my mouth moving. That week for those episodes, in fact, for about a month, the BBC wanted people to understand what it was like for a deaf person if you don't look at them. Um, and so the whole point of my character was for people to understand. So when I was ranting to Ben, sometimes they cut my dialogue out and you would just see me going because they wanted the public to understand that for a deaf person how frustrating is it you know yeah. so yeah. i'm circling around ben and i'm giving him 
quite a tough time. And he's exasperated with me and he won't tell me where his father is. He won't replace the car. So I storm off threatening and I walk across Albert Square, which is the famous square. I get in my car, but unbeknownst to me, Ben's young daughter, Lexi, is running over um, to look for her dad because she's heard somebody ranting at her dad. And she obviously she's just a young girl. And I get in my car and I'm so angry. I reverse my car and I run over Lexi. Mm. Now, if anybody watches EastEnders, they know you don't mess with a Mitchell. You don't mess with a Mitchell. Yeah. And I get out of the car and I see what I've done and I'm off. And the episode ends with Lexi lying there. <laughs> Have I killed Lexi? Well, everybody's wondering what's going to happen. Of course, lockdown happens. They rewrite the script because of safe distancing and all of that. They throw storylines out. Obviously, mine wasn't, you know, the most important storyline ever. So my storyline doesn't come back. So she doesn't die. Everyone thought I killed her. She doesn't die. But usually when you cross the Mitchells, it's a bit like the Sopranos. They sort you out afterwards, you know. So everyone assumed I was going to come back and end up swimming with the fishes or whatever. Mm. Yeah. So that never happened. So I doubt my character will come back because it's obviously pre-lockdown. Yeah. But maybe they will allow me to go back as another character down the line, you know, but it was great being on the lot. You know, it's like, you know, it's fabulous as an actor to go like it was on Shepherd in Shepperton to go on the New York sidewalk, to go in the dockside in New York, you know, with Pat O'Brien. I started telling you the story of James Cagney's best friend, best friend, oh, Pat, yeah. Pat famous Irish American actor, Pat O'Brien. He was in the movie. And I had to escort Pat O'Brien's wife. I had a little scene with her. And you know what the sad thing about it is? When the movie came out, I was so excited. Went to see the movie. And of course, like a lot of actors, your scene hits the cutting room floor. It didn't all go. But what the director had done is he cut all the dialogue and he'd speeded up the sequence where I escort Pat's wife down the gangplank. And you know when you watch... Um, Charlie Chaplin thing, and it's all so we come down with a piano clinkling like a like a um, one of those scenes. So unfortunately, although I'm still in the movie, you see me for about half a second escorting her down the gangplank, uh, like a Charlie Chaplin scene. So that will hit the cutting room floor. But you know what? That's the business. Like my first three records didn't get anywhere. You learn it's not a sprint; it's a marathon. And now. I'm, I'm on the 25th, well, maybe not the 25th mile of the marathon. Maybe I've got a few more miles to go. But, you know, you turn upon, you t the thing is, for an artist who turns up on a long-running drama, you're there to bring energy as a new character because they're in there week in, week out, and you have to go in and bring something new. And, and that quite often actors in long-running shows love the artists that come in for a couple of episodes because you bring in energy and you lift their performances because they're, they're used to acting with the same faces every week and they get to act with new faces and it gives them another edge and it gives them a boost. So yes. it's great going in because they love you going in and you're going in with your excitement and everyone gets a lift from it. And you just hope that maybe you get invited back sometime. That's it, right? Who knows? <laughs> Who knows? After seeing this, they'll probably, you know, I'll probably be locked away somewhere in the tower. Are you kidding me? You're going to have everybody calling you after this. <laughs> well, the only thing they're going to say is, Daniel, stop waving your arms around. I think I need one of those jobs, you know, the airport where they wave the planes in. That's it. You know? I've had a couple of 747s trying to land tonight. Not the cats, <laughs> it's the 747s. That's, That's it. Nice <laughs> no thought of going, being a comedian at all, huh? At all. Comedian? I make people cry. <laughs> I don't know. I never thought of it. No, come on. I'm an actor. I'm a singer. You know, maybe in between my songs, I'll knock out. I, I, I can't tell a joke for the life of me. <laughs> what What has the last two and a half hours been? <laughs> Hard work for your listeners, for your, for your viewers. The viewers, the loveities. I'm so sorry, everybody listening. I'm seriously. Are you this kidding? They love be a little chat. I, I'll probably wake up tomorrow and go, you know, when you wake up and you think. He's still a I humble say? Brit. He's still a humble Brit. <laughs> no, but, you know, I've I've said things that well, I haven't told anybody, you know. I'm uh, going to have to send the boys over to steal this tape. <laughs> 
the boys, <laughs> the uh, the choir boys. boys the the ones are coming we, over, the man. Ones we singing at uh, Westminster uh, Abbey. <laughs> so oh, no bless them. them! Did you yeah. see? I mean, the, the service. Whole those, ceremony the was choir, beautiful. The choir boys in their surplices, you know. Yes. Great voices, great the voices. Whole thing. Well, somebody that's here that usually pops in towards the latter part that wanted to say uh, hello and talk about stamina and longevity in these crazy industries. Mr. George Burns, the comedian, is here. <laughs> wow, what a legend. There he is with his cigar and his red hanky. He pops in and he always likes to say, you know, he had a great time. He learned a lot. You knocked it out of the park. He can't wait George. to listen to the music. And he oh, said, George, it's, it's you remember him. <laughs> to meet you, George. Well, I just wonder where Gracie is. Yeah, she's uh, she's on assignment right now. <laughs> you know which, where Gracie is? She's sitting at home with her feet up listening to my music. Come on. She's listening to your music. And do you think if you were to call Simon Cowell's, uh, and so George sends his love, sends his best. My aunt collected dolls, uh, famous Hi, dolls. George. It's it got, fabulous. Uh, Have you got any more? Is that your only one? Well, there are others, but we do have Gilligan from the TV series Gilligan's Island also. Wow, fantastic. And by uh, the actor Bob Denver, who played him, his wife, who was a guest on our show, Dream of Denver, she sent fantastic. this along. Fantastic. It's great. Stuff, it's really huh? good. I wish you had a Larry Hagman. My favorite ah. of all TV series was Dallas, you know? You didn't get a bobblehead doll when you guys were in Yell? Unfortunately not. I mean, I was when Larry Hagman came over and sang for the Queen Mother at the Royal Variety performance, that famous thing where yes. bless him, he forgot, he forgot the words to the song, you know, but he's such a charmer and he tipped his hat and the dollars fell out. Yeah. You know, I was too young then to, you know, to be around, but Dallas was huge here, you know, and of course I still had my crush on Linda Gray. Linda Gray. Did you ever meet? Oh, you did? You met yeah. her? Very yeah. briefly. Yeah. yeah. Very briefly. You know, that's right. You but, said, um, yeah. Yeah, so, um, well, good for George. It's nice to see George. Yeah, George and is here. And for Simon Cowell, you never know. One of his, uh, I'm in the Heritage chart currently. I'm in the, uh, the top oh, that's 20. that's what I was going to say. Do you think that your song is still on his voicemail? <laughs> wow. Um, I don't know about that, but maybe my new one should go on there with Do You Remember right. Me? Because right. you know what? He's got, he had an artist just before us called Sunita. Uh, and Sunita had been a girlfriend of his. And when you see Simon going for his Christmas holidays to Barbados and stuff. Some of his exes go with him. They're all still friends. And Sunita is one of the ones that go. And as it happens, she's got a record in the um, heritage chart at the moment. And I've just leapfrogged her record. So I'm kind of thinking, oh, Simon, have you noticed I've leapfrogged your friend's record? I like that. Do you remember me? That's a new expression too for us here. I leapfrogged her. Wow. You know what? I'm going to have to come back at some point That's and give cool. you guys yeah. some, we, some. We got to freshen up stuff. Awesome. We're overusing awesome. <laughs> yeah, we, we need to. I need to give you some new words in the grammar and the explanation because I want all of your your viewers to go to the supermarket tomorrow and use some of these words. You know, they need to go to the fruit stall and say, hey, what's the fruit like? I might want a second bite of that cherry, you know? Yeah, this line is too long and I have a doctor's appointment. Can I leapfrog the line? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Without getting arrested. You without know? getting arrested. Exactly. <laughs> that is cool. We so, used to do uh, leapfrog at school. You need to look leapfrog. You learn leapfrog at school. It's it's a thing you do over people. So that's what you do. That's it. You know, See? you learn something new every day, my friend. You learn Even something you new every want... day. We used to play leapfrog too. I remember that. That was a school game that we played and you the, get you know, now i don't health and safety now you cannot even say you know i like your hair <laughs> that's out <laughs> exactly i mean i'm uh, gonna you know some of the things i've said tonight i'll probably be arrested by the pc police tomorrow <laughs> just the, for my singing alone where can people find the music is it the website the danieljames.com and spotify and are you all over there's a website the danieljames.com it's just being built but there's a yeah. there's a link on there spotify apple amazon deezer uh, the street corner some geezer probably the corner at the lemonade street. stand yes the lemonade stand yeah but you know what listen i'm so grateful to be having a second bite of the cherry and i'm not being overly humble there i genuinely am and it'd be great if people look up my songs and if you like them if you don't fine you've had a listen but thank you you know thank you for the interview and the chat oh, and uh, pleasure, as i say friend. i'll probably be in touch in the morning saying oh my god what did i say on there because i've spilled a lot of beans tonight i'm like jack and the beanstalk 
Do you know that one? Yes, absolutely. Yes. And, well, I spilled you, those beans tonight, you know, without you, you were real, you were authentic, you were inspiring. You make me feel like to a sing. love of tea. <laughs> My, yeah, love of tea. You've got to patent that word, I'm telling you. Patent it? I'm going to patent it. <laughs> yeah, you've got to do it because you know what? Now you've spilled the beans. Somebody's going to take that from you. Everybody's me, been spilling the beans tonight. <laughs> anyway. You're the best, truly. Uh, I am it's, it's honored that you time. joined us, Daniel James. Uh, you have been open. You've been real. You've taken us full circle. You've opened up about your life, your music, the things that you're passionate about, the ups and downs. And I think whether people are in the industry or not, it's extreme. Your story is extremely inspiring. Your music has always been terrific. You've got a fantastic voice. You're very humble about it all. You're very super talented. And it's so nice to see that you believe in yourself enough that's coming back that you want to share with us more music, more entertainment, and more of yourself through the music. So we wish you nothing but continued joy and blessing in your life. And I hope the show met whatever expectations you had and you enjoyed the time with me as much as I absolutely I have with you. Me. Jim, thank you for having me. I genuinely, I knew your name. You're a great guy. You've got a great show. I'm going to Google it and watch some of your old shows. I had no idea. Fantastic. I, I wish you much success. Lots of love to your listeners. Do you know what? I am as dry as a monk's sandal. Oh, really? I can, I can put you put close. I'll pour some in. I have a lot left. <laughs> oh, my. See, I've done all the talking, but I've done all the drinking. Is yours cold now? It must be freezing. It's cold. Yeah, yeah it's yeah, cold. Yeah, yeah. But I'm in the Northeast, too, so it's fine. <laughs> kind, to, generous, supportive you, Daniel to, James. As they say in my home accent, two Northeast lads. I like that. <laughs> Slancha. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Lovely to meet you, Jim. And, uh, you know, thank you very much for having me. Spread the word about our show, my friend. If you know other folks you think would like to pop I'll be all on. Over socials. I'll be all over us. I genuinely, you know, I've just learned to do all the big social stuff. It's like yes, a big you can share the episode on your social media. Tell people to tune in. I'll put like a health warning on there. Could bring on a coma. <laughs> put on a pot of coffee or tea. <laughs> put, eat, put on a eat very dinner high. first. Eat dinner first. <laughs> Go, yeah, don't plan to go to the movies. Eat dinner first. No, we're going to submit this for an Emmy or an Oscar. Are you kidding me? No, you, <laughs> you, you haven't been, you have not been topped because no, actually, there is somebody that has topped you, and that is the actor Scott Schwartz. He still holds the record. Scott Schwartz was the actor in the movie A Christmas Story. And uh, he was the kid that was uh, that got his tongue stuck on the pole, the bratty kid in the Christmas story. He also was in uh, the toy with Richard Pryor and Jackie Gleason. Wow. He was he this was during the beginning of the pandemic. He came on as a guest from Los Angeles, from his backyard. He was outdoors, wow. backyard. Everything had shut. He would go to a lot of those comic con shows and shows where they sign autographs for child stars and all that stopped. And he opened up about his life too and all the struggles and things that were happening since that. He was on for six hours. What? <laughs> not, you not, me. not the British. I love the sound of it. It wasn't what? It was what? <laughs> It's called, what? it's called diction. We There's get even big some air before the W. See, they do the air diction. before the W. What? what? Exactly. <sighs> you know, if, if I couldn't be in the Jersey Boys, because when they go, oh, what a night, I'd have to go, oh, oh what a night. <laughs> if anybody's wearing a toupee, <laughs> if it blows off. Back in <laughs> oh, 63. What? Do you know what I mean? Yes. It's, it's called diction. But listen, diction. did you did the show go out for six hours or did you edit it down? Six hours live. Wow. That one, that one was live and it was six hours. Wow. And, it was, wow. Did and you I was sitting in the chair the whole time. There were no breaks or anything. There's no like commercials. <laughs> Did your bum ache in the chair? <laughs> it must have been going like, wow. <laughs> wow. Did you go? How much coffee did you go through? Wow, I'm amazing. I, I think I, I, I think they had to lift me out of the chair because I was lift stuck me like up. this. I was stuck in that chair position. <laughs> you know what I've realized, Jim? You're not. You're a fabulous interviewer and a fabulous host. 
But I actually think people are using you. You need to redefine. People are using you as their therapist. That's what this is. That has You've happened. Since lockdown, you are now entertainers, therapists. You should and be I, charging. And I don't, I don't charge a copay either. <laughs> you should, should be charging. Should. Seriously. Right. Yeah. I'm I just should. trying to think what, what you've got I could pay you with, you know. A um, couple of pounds, man. Hey, when you're back over oh, here. Ring me up. If I'm over there, ring me up and we'll break bread, you know, and we'll toast. We will definitely stay in touch. You're breaking the internet tonight. (laughs) When this goes out, people are becoming across the bottom going, I've gone through my second razor blade. I've had two shaves since this guy's been on. (laughs) Two shaves. (laughs) Two shaves. Yeah, I've had two shaves. (laughs) And not just my legs. (laughs) And he says he's not a comedian. I tell you right. guys. You better go seriously. You've probably got another guest queue and they're banging on the door. They're on in about an hour. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and go and have a lie down in a dark room. Forget you ever met me. Oh. Right. And start afresh. Ah, absolutely not. The, the not the, the Daniel James.com. The Daniel the James was on the Jim Masters show too, right here for all of you. Thank it's you, Jim. Guy. It was a pleasure. It and was and a, I hope we meet again, okay? Yeah. And I'm going to watch your shows because really, please fantastic. do. Yes. And yeah, um, I, I call it conversations, to... old school conversations. We have not even interviews, conversations because I think right. people so, Jim, are you craving are, that. You are a born therapist, um, Daniel James, 1925 on Twitter. If anybody wants to get in touch, I'd love you to follow me. I'll follow you back. That would be an honor. Thank you so much. And follow you, follow me. This was awesome, my friend. You be well and you take care. And I really hope you enjoyed yourself on the show. It's been different. <laughs> I'm teasing. It's been wonderful. Thank you so much. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good morning. Good day. Good night, wherever good morning, you are. Good morning. Good day. It could be anywhere around the world. Exactly. Yes. 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 Somebody could be watch- watching. That person in the in the igloo that you mentioned earlier could be yeah. watching. You know, their little rod waiting for the whale. Come up. By, they could by be now the igloo has melted. <laughs> And it's a flood. Like, do you know what? That sounds like a code word. When, unfortunately, poor Queen Elizabeth passed away, it was London Bridge has fallen. Yes. That was the code word for the government and for radio stations. We all got an email saying London Bridge has fallen. We had to stop playing certain records. Well, the igloo was melted. You don't know what you set off by saying that. That could oh, have set no. a chain of events. Uh-oh. You know? We'll have they to- could be in the dark in Reykjavik as we speak. <laughs> Right, we better go. Seriously, this is go. fantastic. It's uh, uh, parting is such sweet sorrow. Neither one of us are goodbye people, obviously. <laughs> but you be well. We'll keep the porch light on for you too. You're welcome back any time, my friend. Let's just, stay in just touch. Quickly, another saying: You and I could talk the hind legs off a donkey. Write that down. I want to use that. <laughs> there you go. Good night. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Jim. It's been great. Oh, it's been a pleasure, my friend. You be well. You take care. Keep believing in yourself and keep entertaining us with your great music. We really appreciate all the time, Daniel James. You're the best, okay? Thank and you. stay in touch. Bye-bye Cheers. now. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Cheers. Daniel James on the Jim Masters Show. If you do want to connect with him, the thedanieljames.com. That is... The website, and as he mentioned, Spotify and iTunes and all over, you can find the music. And we were talking about uh, the newest song, Do You Remember Me Now, which is really fantastic. Isn't he a great guy? True. He's humble. He is funny. He doesn't think he's funny. He's very funny. And he was so open and so real and so conversational. He shared a lot. And, you know, a lot of our guests do. They come on the show and You know, they think maybe we're going to just talk about the new CD or the book or the movie or whatever. And we end up having fantastic, uh, legendary conversations. Great guy. Uh, He's really come full circle in his life. And again, you probably have seen him on things like Passions and EastEnders. But uh, great music out, too, and quite a bit. And we're excited that... um, you know, he had an opportunity to spend this amount of time with us here on the Jim Masters show and share it with all of you. He talked about that too. Set your spirit free, which is so true. We all need to do that. And of course, you do remember him from Yale and probably have the music 
from the group as well. You know, he's tasted life in a lot of different, uh, different ways and, uh, the ups, the downs, and he was real and authentic and, uh, even a protege of Simon Cowell, which was kind of cool. He talked about that singer, actor, songwriter, extraordinaire, really a great guy. Daniel James coming to us from England with his wit and wisdom, sang a little for us here and there as well. And it was truly, truly a pleasure. The Daniel James or the Daniel James.com is the website to connect with him and check out all the music. And I know you guys are excited uh, that he was on the show today. So we were excited to have him as well. We appreciate all of you. Of course, you guys know we don't say goodbye around here. We say see you later. Cheer. Uh, cheers, ciao. We say slancha. We say hasta la vista. Vida Zain. Sayonara. Be well. Take care. And uh, Moy Loop, we say as well. Don't forget, if you enjoyed this episode, give it a thumbs up on our YouTube channel. Yeah, there's a thumbs up icon on the YouTube channel. Make sure you give it a thumbs up. Leave a comment for us and subscribe to our YouTube channel, Gym Masters TV. That's where there's almost 800 episodes of the Gym Masters Show series, Entertainment Lifestyle Variety Talk Show series available for you. And don't forget to subscribe to the YouTube channel, Gym Masters TV as well. We love all of you watching around the world. Thanks for all the great comments, all the passion, the enthusiasm. We know you guys enjoyed the show. It was a pleasure. On He'll be back. We'll keep the light on for him as well. Don't forget to binge watch uh, almost 800 episodes of our show. Go back and see the guests that come in from Broadway, Hollywood, television, film, Thanks for being with us. We'll see you again soon. We love having you with us on the Gym Master Show. Cheers. Mm -hmm.